On the night of April 28, 1970, in Talmadge, Ohio, Karen Louise, an 18-year-old blonde, left her parents' house at around 11.15 p.m. Her apartment was only four blocks away and she decided to walk the distance, but she would never make it home. The next morning around 7.30 a.m. on April 29, 1970, Karen was found brutally murdered. Five years later, another tragedy struck Talmadge. This time, it was the 21-year-old Loretta Jean Davis. Loretta had returned home from a date just past midnight on September 27, 1975. Later, she left a note for her parents telling them that she was going out to grab a bite. Loretta never returned home and her body was discovered by a motorist on September 28, 1975. What really happened with Karen and Loretta? Was this the work of a single person or were there multiple killers loose on the streets of Talmadge? The mystery has finally been solved after a wait of 50 years. Today, we will be looking at the cases of Karen Benson and Loretta Davis, who finally got justice five decades after their brutal assault and murder. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now, without any further ado, let's dive into the mystery. Talmadge is a city in eastern Summit County, Ohio, United States. It has a small district in Portage County and is a suburb of Akron. Although the city has beautiful scenic geography, it is not considered to be a very safe city. It is safer than only 26% of the U.S. cities and the chances of being a victim of a violent crime in Talmadge are 1 to 872. And it was here where two such violent crimes took place in the 1970s to which Karen and Loretta fell victim. Karen Lewis Bentz, born August 1, 1951, was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. Leland Bentz. Her loved ones used to call her siren, an affectionate nickname. Karen had a sister named Sandra and a brother named Jerry Lee, who was the youngest sibling. Both Sandra and Jerry had a close bond with Karen and looked up to her. Karen's best friend, Patricia Statler, used to stay right behind Karen's parents' house on Arlington Street. Karen and Patricia went to Central High School together. However, Karen never graduated and had to drop out in 1967 as she had gotten pregnant. That same year, Karen gave birth to a girl and named her Lori. Karen was also married to a man named Dave Groves for a short time. Karen was an attractive 18-year-old, 5-foot, for blonde back in 1970. She stayed in Talmadge, sharing an apartment with a secretary at 56 North Arlington, where she had moved in March 1970. Karen was working two jobs to show her parents that she could make it on her own too while Lori was staying with Mr. and Mrs. Leland Benson. Karen used to work seven hours at Lawson's on South Main Street near Wilbeth Avenue and four hours at the Red Barn across from the City Hospital on East Market. At the time, Karen had a 20-year-old boyfriend named Bill Shad, who was a student at Akron University. Sandra described her sister Karen as a beautiful and kind person who was also a caring mother and sister. Karen had a normal day on April 28, 1970. She first worked her shift at the Red Barn and then at Lawson's. After completing her shift at Lawson's, Karen went to her parents' place at 56 Judith Street around 10 p.m. She had come home to pick up her plain white uniform, a girdle, stockings, and penny loafers. Karen used to work for long hours at a stretch and usually didn't have enough time to do her laundry, so her mother used to wash and iron her clothes and uniforms for her. After collecting her things around 11.15 p.m., Karen left for her apartment at 56 North Arlington Street, but she never arrived there. The following day, on April 29, 1970, around 7.30 a.m., Karen's body was spotted by a motorist named Coleman just off the Indian Hills Road, six miles from her apartment. Pinkston was driving through the elusive Talmadge Woods when he found her. He drove up to Ben Ware's house who stayed nearby and telephoned the authorities. The police found Karen's body face down fully clothed along the Indian Hills Road. She had been stabbed 12 times in the chest with a knife and also been strangled. Some of the stab wounds had gone so deep that they pierced her lungs and heart. The strangulation had left hemorrhaging throughout her face, mostly around her eyes. The police didn't find any semen or any injuries consistent with the sexual assault. Although it did appear like there had been an attempt of sexual assault on Karen and the killer might have struck her with a knife when she retaliated. The killer's DNA was found under Karen's fingernails, which indicated signs of struggle. She was wearing a light-colored jumpsuit, a yellow spring jacket, and sandals. Captain Jerry Knapp noticed a set of tire tracks near the body and determined that Karen had been dropped off from a vehicle after being stabbed. There wasn't a purse or any identification papers on Karen. 
Sergeant David Williams traced her identity through initials on a central high class of 1969 ring found on her finger. On East Avenue, which was less than a mile away from where Karen's body was found, the police discovered the girdle, worn penny loafer stockings, and one of the dresses Karen was carrying. There were no bloodstains on any of the items found. The police assumed that the killer might have thrown these items out of their car when fleeing the crime scene. The other white dress that Karen was carrying was found at the Southeast Avenue exit of the East Expressway, which was nearly two miles away from where the body was found. The Talmadge Police Department joined hands with the Akron Police Department to work together on this case and try to put the culprit behind bars. They started by collecting information about Karen from her family members and then went on to question Karen's co-workers and neighbors. Sadly, nothing important came out of it. Ray West, Karen's manager at the Red Barn, said Karen was great at her job. The regular customers knew her and she made friends easily. Bill Shod, Karen's boyfriend, told the police that Karen had asked him to call her a little after 11 p.m. And when he did, she hadn't arrived at her apartment. Her roommate answered the phone and Bill dropped her a number for Karen to call on. She had never called back. On May 1, 1970, Karen's funeral took place at Ecker Baldwin Funeral Home followed by her burial at Oakwood Cemetery in Cuyahoga Falls. The police kept looking for any clues or answers for years but came up with nothing. In an article titled Getting Away with Murder, published in the Sunday, May 25, 1975, issue of the Akron Beacon Journal, the writer stated that it was very unlikely that Karen Bence's murder would ever be solved. And just like that, Karen's case went cold and it seemed like it was forgotten. But Karen wasn't the only one with an ill fate. Loretta Jean Davis, daughter of Robert and Martha Davis, was a talented 20-year-old woman in 1975. Her loved ones used to call her Jeannie. She was nearly six feet tall and had soft mint green colored eyes. Loretta had light brown colored hair, which she kept in a long shag style. Loretta stayed with her parents at 286 Old Forge Road in Brimfield. Martha, Loretta's mother, had a work from home data processing job and Loretta would often work with her to help out. Loretta had dreams of studying business at Kent State University. Her friends thought of her as an easygoing but impulsive girl who would often do things in the spur of the moment. She wasn't a very outgoing person and mostly kept to herself. Loretta was quite athletic and used to love baton twirling for which she even won a few trophies. Loretta had a nice stereo in her room and she liked to dance and listen to blues and rock and roll. Loretta was very quiet and reserved around strangers, but her personality flipped around the ones she was comfortable with. Around her friends, she was quite outspoken and brutally honest. If she disagreed with someone, she would speak right up, but if things escalated to an argument, she would walk away. As the clock approached midnight on Saturday, September 27, 1975, Loretta had returned home to 286 Old Forge Road in Brimfield Township from a date. She had gone to watch a drive-in movie and then for dinner. Sometime after returning home in the early hours of September 28, 1975, around 12.15 a.m., Loretta's parents heard her leave the house again. They found a note left behind by Loretta saying that she was going out to get something to eat and would be home soon, but her note didn't say where she was going. She never came back home. Around noon on Sunday, September 28, 1975, Loretta's body was found to the side of the Congress Lake Road, nearly one and a half miles from Waterloo Road in Suffield Township. When the police found Loretta's body, they immediately suspected foul play. Loretta's jeans had been slid down to below her hips and the top half of her body was naked with her shirt over her head. County Coroner Robert Sibbert claimed that Loretta had been dead for 8 to 12 hours at the time her body was found. She had been sexually assaulted and stabbed twice, one on each side of her chest. The county coroner initially thought that one of the stabs went through her heart and left lung, which allowed the blood to flow into it and ultimately caused her death. When Loretta's autopsy report arrived, the cause of death was ruled as a stab to the heart. A small black-colored plastic piece, which was believed to have been a part of a knife handle, was found stuck in her blouse. There were also red fibers tangled into the soles of her shoes. Victor Biasella, an investigator, noticed grooves in the dirt near Loretta's body, which suggested that she had been dragged to the location where her body was found. The investigators were sure that Loretta had been killed in a different location and then brought to Congress Lake Road. The police started the investigation by interviewing Loretta's close ones. One of Loretta's close friends who didn't want to disclose her identity told the police that Loretta might have gone to her favorite bar, Filthy McNasty, at 200 South Deepeaster Street, but they start closing at 12.30 a.m., 
so she couldn't possibly have made it there in time. The other place she thought Loretta could have gone to was Bordenberger in Kent at 1550 South Water Street. That is where she would always go. But all this information from Loretta's friend led the police nowhere. Even after searching through multiple places throughout the city, the police didn't find anything. A few days later, a tip came in telling the investigators that Loretta was seen in the early hours of the morning of September 28, 1975, around 2 a.m. She was seen with an unidentified man at Talmadge Auto Parts on Southeast Avenue in Talmadge before she was killed. When the detectives arrived, they found an unlocked Plymouth Duster, Loretta's car, with her purse and personal items resting on the passenger seat. For months, there were no new leads or suspects in Loretta's case. But in 1965, the police questioned Gustav Safras, a local man who had been in and out of prison for multiple sexual assault charges. Upon being interrogated, he denied even knowing the victim, Loretta Davis. Slowly, the progress in Loretta's case started to decay and her case went cold too. Loretta Jean Davis was buried in Ruslan Cemetery, Portage County, Ohio. Karen and Loretta's cases had been cold for a long time, but in 2013, the police department found a piece of key evidence and determined that both cases were connected. Detective Williams said that he couldn't specifically discuss the evidence but credited the new technology, a fresh set of eyes, and great detective work. Although the police department didn't say much about this piece of evidence, Captain Doug Bohan went on to disclose that they had found DNA of the killer under Karen's fingernails. Due to technological limitations back in the 1970s, they couldn't examine this to get the information they needed to hunt the killer down. But now, with the advancement in science, they were able to send this evidence for examination and it was used to extract the killer's DNA sample. It was now a waiting game. The Talmadge Police Department was eagerly awaiting the results of the test of the new evidence. Meanwhile, they left no other stone unturned and went through the case files twice to see if there was anything else that they had missed out on, but years went by and nothing important came up. After a long wait in 2019, a DNA sample of the killer was developed. When the police ran the DNA sample through their database, they found a match which led them back to Gustav Safaras, the man who had been in and out of prison multiple times for sexually assaulting a number of women. On digging a little deeper, the police found more information on Safras's criminal history and that he had already been questioned back in 1976 regarding Loretta's murder. Going through Safras' long history of crime, the police were sure that this man was most likely the killer. They believed that even though he had escaped jail time previously, they had enough evidence to put him behind bars for good this time. Captain Doug Bohan, who had worked in Talmadge Police Department in 2000, retired in 2022 after serving about 22 years. Even after his retirement, he stayed committed to Karen and Loretta's case, hoping that he would finally solve it one day and that time had finally come. With a team of highly skilled officers like Dave Chakala, Captain Doug Bohan was now determined to send Safaras behind bars. Gustav Alexander Safaras was born on July 23, 1944, in Akron, Ohio, United States. He grew up in Goodyear Heights with his parents and a younger sister. His parents owned Safri's Restaurant, a popular and busy 24-hour steak and eggs place. Safri's went to East High School and then later joined Akron University. However, he dropped out from the university and had to join the army as the Vietnam War had escalated. In 1965, Safries was a private first class with the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. When he returned, he had a tattoo on one of his arms bearing death before dishonor. Upon his return, Gustav struggled with multiple jobs and didn't stick to anyone for long. In 1972, Gustav got married and moved to Huntington, West Virginia, but even his married life was short-lived as his wife filed for a divorce in 1974 and separated from him. They never had any children. Safra landed a job as an auto salesman in 1975. Gustav's acts of crime spanned from 1970 to 1991. Safra's was no stranger to the world of crime and the list of his vicious acts kept going. In March 1970, Safras was given two years probation for sexually assaulting a woman he was on a date with. He pleaded guilty to lesser charges as part of a plea agreement. In December 1972, Safras was accused of the sexual assault and kidnap of a 22-year-old woman, but the jury declared a mistrial. In January 1973, a 20-year-old woman accused Safras of giving her a ride and forcing her to perform oral sex on him. The grand jury returned a no-bill. 
In May 1975, an Akron woman accused Safaras of threatening her with a knife and sexually assaulting her right outside her home, to which Safaras claimed that they had consensual sex. In June 1975, another Akron woman accepted a ride from Safaras. She was choked until she went unconscious and then was sexually assaulted. Safaras pleaded guilty to the assault. It wasn't until 1977 that Safras was sentenced to 15 to 60 years in prison for the sexual assault of a 28-year-old woman in Cuyahoga Falls. Before sentencing, prosecutor at a psychiatric exam showed that Safras was neither mentally deficient nor psychotic, but concluded that Safras was seriously psychologically disturbed. Safaris got parole in November 1990 but violated his parole by victimizing another woman and went on to serve more time in prison until September 2000. During the short period of time when he was out on parole, he was also accused of killing Bonita Virginia Parker in 1991. Even though his DNA was found on Miss Parker, the defendants argued that she was a prostitute and Safaris had been with her, but it didn't prove that he killed her. Gustav Alexander Safras was arrested from his Jackson Township home in Talmadge on September 6, 2019, for the murder of Karen Louise Spence in 1970 and Loretta Jean Davis in 1975. On March 16, 2023, Gustav was found guilty of aggravated murder, murder, first-degree murder involving an abduction, second-degree murder, and maiming or disfiguring another. On April 5, 2023, Judge Allison Bro sentenced him to life in prison without the ability of parole. Mr. Safaris, on count one murder in the first degree, I'm sentencing you to a period of incarceration, 15 to life. I'm sentencing you to life without the possibility of parole. With the murder of Loretta Jean Davis. And count one is with regard to the murder of Karen Benson. And he is currently being held as an inmate in Summit County Jail. Even though Gustav Safras was arrested and indicted in 2019, he was charged according to the laws that would have been in play at the time the crimes were committed. Sandra Utterbach, Karen Benson's sister, who is now 71 years old, was present virtually at the sentencing. She was relieved to see her sister's killer finally face consequences for his actions. Sandra also got emotional during the sentencing, thinking of her sister, and had some words to say to Safras. Sandra Utterback Karen's sister gave everyone the insights of what actually happened in her family after Karen's untimely departure. The brutality in Karen's case drove her family members to an unstable mental state. She remembered that her father had a nervous breakdown and nailed all the windows shut in their house, fearing for Jerry Lee, Karen's brother, and Sandra's safety. He wouldn't let any of his kids out of his sight anymore. Their mother turned into an alcoholic just to numb herself from her feelings, which eventually pushed her into depression. Sandra stated that at a very young age, she had to give up on her childhood and start taking care of Jerry and Lori, Karen's daughter. She was forced to become the head of the family when she herself was devastated. She knew that nothing could bring Karen and the lost joys of their family back, but she finally felt peace and got closure when Safris was arrested. Karen's husband, Dave Grove, also shared some thoughts on Safris' arrest. Even though he was married to Karen for a short time, he was still happy that her killer had now been caught and will pay for his heinous crimes. Patricia Fletcher, formerly Patricia Statler, was Karen's close friend. When she heard the news of Karen's killer being arrested, she jumped up in joy and screamed hallelujah. She was surprised that it was Gustav Safras, a man she never knew. She had always thought that Karen was killed by someone they both knew. She remembered hearing about Karen's murder from Mr. and Mrs. Leland Benson. She was scared and moved away in the next few days. She feared that the killer might know her too and she might be next. Patricia later moved back to Akron and hoped that Karen's killer would be caught someday. She still has an old photograph of her and Karen that helps her to keep their memories together alive. The Talad Police Department stated that Safras' capture was one of the proudest moments in TPD history and most likely the greatest individual achievement. Retired Captain Doug Bohan believed that the sentence Saffir Scott was appropriate and long overdue. Saffirs had walked free for a very long time and it was about time they arrested him. He hoped that all the police departments take a good look at all the cold cases they have because they might find an important clue that was not noticed before. Karen Benson and Loretta Davis's murders left their ones in shock for 50 years. Thankfully, with the help of detectives like Doug Bohan who never gave up looking for Karen and Loretta's killer, the case was finally cracked. This kind of dedication and hard work from the police department will hopefully become the key to tracking many of the other cold cases in the future. Do you think Gustav got away with any more assaults or murders that went unnoticed? 
Do you think Gustav has any remorse for the crimes he committed? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. It was just two days before Jerry Martin's fourth birthday when tragedy struck. On that fateful day on July 9, 1945, a mysterious woman approached Jerry and his older brother Tom, who was six, and lured Jerry away with her. For years, the boy remained missing and his family eventually accepted the worst. But after 74 years, a very shocking revelation emerged from an entirely unexpected source. How did this revelation come to light after so long? Why did it take 74 years? Let's unravel the mystery together. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel by now, please consider hitting the subscribe and like buttons. Let's dive into the mystery without further ado. Today's case takes us to Manhattan, one of the five boroughs of New York City and the one with the highest population density of them all. The Hudson East River and Harlem Rivers encircle Manhattan Island, which marks the majority of the area. It is the core of the Big Apple, one of the biggest commercial, financial, and cultural areas in the world. The Empire State Building, Times Square, and Broadway are some of its most recognizable landmarks. Manhattan has been described as the cultural, financial, media, and entertainment capital of the world and holds the United Nations headquarters. The majority of the world's art auctions are held at various art galleries and auction houses in Manhattan, which also acts as the hub of the international art market. It is in this bustling metropolis that our story begins today. July 9, 1945, was a warm summer day and two young brothers Tom and Jerry were riding their bikes together near their home in Manhattan. As they were pedaling along, a mysterious woman approached them and offered them some candy. While Tom was hesitant and refused the offer, his younger brother Jerry couldn't resist the temptation and eagerly accepted the treat. The woman then took Jerry by the hand and promised Tom that they would return shortly. However, as the hours ticked by, there was no sign of the woman or Jerry. Tom freaked out and ran to inform his parents that his little brother had been kidnapped. Their parents became increasingly worried and contacted the authorities, launching a frantic search for their missing son. Despite extensive efforts, Jerry was never found and his disappearance remained a mystery that haunted Tom and his family for the rest of their lives. The pain of losing a child in such a sudden and traumatic way was unimaginable and the Martin family was forever scarred by this tragic event. Harold Martin and Nancy Martin were the parents of the two boys, Tom and Jerry Martin. Unfortunately, the couple had already separated at the time when Jerry disappeared, leaving the family shattered and distressed. Adding to the complexity of the situation, Harold had remarried and had a one-year-old daughter named Mary, which created further ambiguity around Jerry's disappearance. Police wondered whether one of the parents had taken the boy due to a personal dispute. Despite the circumstances, Nancy maintained her innocence and insisted that she had nothing to do with Jerry vanishing. Her family stood firmly by her side, never doubting her claims. However, as time passed, the mystery of Jerry's disappearing remained unresolved and the family was left to pick up the pieces and move on with their lives. Months turned into years and before they knew it, decades had gone by with no sign of Jerry. The Martin family never gave up hope that they would one day be reunited with their beloved son and brother. But as the years went on, that hope began to fade. Harold and Nancy passed away, leaving their son Tom to continue the search for Jerry. Determined to find his long-lost brother, Tom spared no effort in his quest for answers. When DNA testing came about in the 2000s, he submitted his DNA for ancestry testing, hoping that the results would provide some clues as to Jerry's whereabouts. Tom remained optimistic even though the search had been going on for so many years. He knew that if there was a chance that Jerry was out there, he had to keep looking. The Martin family's story is one of heartbreak and perseverance. The loss of a child is something that no parent should have to endure, and the fact that Jerry's disappearance remained unsolved after all these years was a tragedy. Nevertheless, Tom's unrelenting commitment to finding his brother served as a testament to the enduring love and resilience of the human spirit. In 2007, a breakthrough came when number one expected it. In order to determine which of her triplets were identical siblings and which was the fraternal sibling, Audrey Bell, a 51-year-old Long Island mother of triplets, bought a 23andMe testing kit online in 2017. Bell was surprised to discover through the 23andMe DNA test that she was not of Italian descent as she had been led to believe by her parents all her life. Instead, the test revealed that her genetic makeup was of Irish, Scottish, and Spanish origin. Audrey was puzzled, especially as her father, Richard Paul Modesto, had always proudly identified with his Italian heritage. Audrey asked her parents about the results, but they were also confused and so she decided to move on with her life. 
Although Audrey had always been informed that her ancestors were from Southern Europe, the results stated nothing about Italy. Belle, whose maiden name was Palmadiso, was raised in a proud Italian-American family in New York. The thought of not being Italian had never even occurred to her. They chalked it up to a computer error and carried on with their lives. The Palmadesos did not inquire more with 23andMe or conduct any other research until two years later. In 2019, Audrey's twin sister, Cynthia McFadden, and their younger sister, Stephanie Palmadiso, took DNA ancestry tests of their own and were shocked to discover that they too lacked any Italian ancestry just to clarify the confusion of the sisters having different surnames Cynthia and Audrey are twin sisters who go by their married last names. When her sister, Cynthia, chose to send in her DNA sample to 23andMe in 2019, the story resurfaced. This time, she also received unexpected answers. The information revealed that Cynthia was also not Italian. The sisters struggled to explain what was happening because their father had been dead for two years by this point. So they went to the next person they felt could have some information. Their cousin Richard Palmadezzo also happened to have the same name as their father. The test's findings were essentially a surprise. Richard revealed to Cynthia and Audrey while they were both linked to one another, the remainder of the Palmadiso family was not even remotely related to them. Cynthia, in contrast to Audrey, had made the choice to allow 23andMe to reveal any genetic relative relationships in their database, which essentially shows someone if there were any other DNA profiles in their database matching with the person's results. She was shocked when a man named Tom Martin appeared as a match for her, and it showed that the twins both shared 22% of their DNA with him, making Tom either their grandfather or uncle. Yet this was also puzzling given that none of the Palmadisos had even spoken to Tom Martin. He was 79 years old at the time, retired, and residing in Florida. He supposedly put in his own DNA to solve the kidnapping of his brother Jerry, and, as luck would have it, it was the key. They later decided to personally reach out to Tom through 23andMe and speak with him. Tom informed Cynthia and Audrey that when he was six years old and his younger brother Jerry was only two days away from turning four, Jerry was abducted on July 9, 1945. Tom spent decades trying to locate his missing brother and eventually created a DNA profile. Cynthia and Audrey began to question whether their father, who they had always known as Richard Palmadezzo, could possibly be Jerry Martin. In the present day, it is uncommon for children to be abducted by strangers in the United States as the cases made up just about 1% of the cases that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children handled in 2019. However, it is challenging to determine the frequency and details of kidnappings that occurred before the 1980s. It was only in 1983 that the Missing Children Assistance Act was enacted and the National Registry for Missing Children was established. What is known is that during the first half of the 20th century, infant and children abductions occurred frequently primarily for the purpose of black market adoption and sometimes directly by women who were unable to conceive and wanted to become mothers. Even if there had been a national database at the time, it would have been difficult to quantify these incidents because families might not have discovered kidnappings until much later, if at all. With no DNA testing available, families may have unknowingly raised children who are not biologically related to them due to a hospital mistake or a cover-up kidnapping. During the first half of the 20th century, the typical kidnapper profile was a woman who was unable to have children and felt societal or partner pressure to have one. Cynthia, suspecting that Jerry Martin may have been Richard Palmadezzo, asked her brother-in-law who worked in law enforcement to investigate the cold case. However, the family was informed that the file may have been destroyed in a precinct fire. This New York Daily News article was one of the pieces of evidence the twins found with details of the kidnapping. As they got to know Tom better, they discovered more similarities and clues that supported the DNA results. After exchanging photos, the twins realized that Tom and Richard had a remarkable resemblance. During their first meeting with Tom in person in 2019, they found out that the similarities did not end there. They were surprised to discover that Tom shared the same interests as their father, such as coconut cake, movies, and acting. Moreover, Tom had some headshots from his younger years indicating his interest in acting. Even though everything seemed to be in order, the question remained, if Richard was indeed Jerry, did the Palmadezos know he had been abducted? Who knew what and how long had they known? Richard Palmateso's birth certificate states that he was born on May 31, 1943, in Staten Island to Isabel and Angelo Palmateso. 
Prior to his birth, Isabel and Angelo had no children together. However, Isabel, who was in her 40s, had two daughters from a previous relation who were already in their 20s. Despite having two grown children from a previous relationship who was in her 40s and had never given birth to a child with Angelo was desperate to give him a child. Before Angelo's September return from the war, she allegedly grabbed Jerry and brought him to their house in June. Isabel informed Jerry that he was now Richard and that he was only two years old, not four. She altered a birth certificate to have his date of birth set to 1943. Please keep in mind that this whole narrative has been theorized and it is best to take it with a grain of salt. Although this was a startling revelation to the sisters during their meeting with Tom Martin, Richard Palmadiso, their father's cousin, thought it was nothing new. He asserted that Richard, their father, was the only member of the Palmadiso family who was uninformed that their father was not a blood connection. The rest of the family understood the truth, according to him. Richard explained to the sisters how their father was shunned by Isabel as a youngster and prevented from speaking at the dinner table. Their father, therefore, developed anxiety which he carried into adulthood. None of his family members, including Angelo, who passed away when their father was 26 years old, made an effort to stay in touch when he finished school and moved away. Richard's daughters had a theory that Isabel's wife may have become pregnant with a child just before or Angelo left for World War II and possibly had a miscarriage or lied to Angelo about being pregnant. With Angelo's return in sight after the Nazi surrender, they speculated whether Isabel felt the need to produce a two-year-old son for him and whether she decided to kidnap Jerry for that purpose. It was suggested by the sisters that Isabel may have kidnapped a child to raise as her own, but they were unable to prove their theory. According to this theory, Isabel's actions were not typical of cases where women kidnap infants to make their husbands believe the child is theirs. What made the situation even more puzzling was how Jerry would have been explained, especially if he had been taken directly to the Palmadezo's home after the abduction. He would have been given a new name and parents and told that he was now two years old instead of four. Tom, his wife, Mary, Audrey, and Cynthia communicate often on text messages and the phone today. The sisters share cherished memories of their father with Tom and Mary as they celebrate each other's big occasions for the time being remotely. Mary gave Tom framed photos of the sisters' visit in Florida earlier this year. He never had any children of his own, so she gave them to him on Father's Day. Even so, Audrey and Cynthia are adding to learning that their father was abducted because he lost out on having siblings with whom he may have formed a close relationship even though there are still a lot of unresolved concerns. The women now have a better understanding of their father thanks to learning about his kidnapping. They remember him as being compassionate, witty, and playful but also struggling with bipolar disorder and persistent anxiety. The twins were never able to understand the distance that existed between him and his family. Now, it all makes sense as to why the majority of the Palmadiso family had lost touch with Richard and had taken either no action or very little initiative to get to his wife and kids. Audrey says that Tom appears to have gained some closure as well. She explains that he becomes upset about the fact that they couldn't meet each other in time to meet again but is pleased to know that her father had a family who loved and cared for him. She adds that Tom is convinced that her dad is now reunited with his biological parents. What were your thoughts on this unexpected discovery? Thanks to DNA testing, now a brother's soul is finally at peace. On June 28, 2004, workers found an unknown torso lying near the bushes of the Wright City rest stop in the state of Missouri. The tragedy with the torso was that there was no way to identify it. It had no head or legs, making it almost impossible for detectives to find any leads on its identity. Was it a hate crime? And how did the police find out the identity of a torso? The answer to all questions lies in the belly of a cold case that was solved after 18 years of constant struggle. The small city of Wright City, Missouri is an often overlooked destination for those seeking an outdoor adventure. With plenty of outdoor activities available throughout the area, there's something for everyone. Whether you're looking for an adrenaline-filled adventure or simply want to enjoy nature, you'll find it in Wright City. From hiking and biking trails to swimming holes, fishing spots, and more, there are endless opportunities for outdoor activities in Wright City, boating on Lake Calhoun, camping on state park grounds, biking through wooded trails, it has something for everyone. From its historical buildings to its sweeping landscape, Wright City is the perfect destination for those seeking a true small-town experience. One of the main benefits of living in the Midwest is a low crime rate compared to cities on either coast. Residents feel safe at night, knowing that they're surrounded by a tight-knit community. 
However, this was not the case in 2004 as the small town was shaken by a gruesome discovery. It was a slow morning in the small town of Wright City on June 28, 2004. The town isn't a busy place after all. Like any other day, some workers were preparing to tidy up the picnic area near the Wright City rest stop on Interstate 70. Some were watering the plants, others were picking up litter. A group of workers was responsible for trimming the bushes of the shrubs that encased the picnic spot so that people might not find sitting there difficult. But they had no idea that this cleaning would result in something so gruesome that even the police would struggle with it for 18 years. While trimming the bushes, some workers found that there was an odd thing thrown inside the deep end of the picnic area. When the workers went closer to check and see what the odd thing was, they discovered a carcass. At first, they thought that it was a mannequin, but they were wrong. It was the torso of a lady. The whole body was not in place. The only thing that the workers could see was a torso without a face, hands, or even legs. They knew that everything about this was wrong and called the police on the spot. When the police came, they discovered that the torso was wearing a black bra and had two surgery marks near the abdomen. The police quickly theorized that these marks were likely from a cesarean procedure or an appendectomy. As the police spread in the area, they started looking sporadically for other clues nearby. While searching, some police officers found a knife nearby that had foreign DNA on it. The police also found DNA on the torso that did not belong to the victim. Now, the police believed that this foreign DNA was likely that of the killer. But the only problem was that there was no way to identify the victim. The police looked around for the other dismembered body parts of the torso around the whole city, but they couldn't find any. It was as if each part of the body had been cut off and disposed of in different cities altogether. At first, the police were confused as there was no way that they could physically identify the body. The body had no face, no hands, no legs, just a torso and a black bra. One thing that the police could do was to take the DNA of the unidentified torso and match it with a family member. But again, when the body isn't identified, there are no named family members. The police couldn't possibly go to every house in Wright City and ask for their DNA samples and they didn't even know if the torso belonged to someone who lived in Wright City. The difficulty in this case was jarring. Imagine having to identify a body that has no relatives, no place, no hands, no legs, and not even a face. The only thing that would keep the investigation going was if someone came up to the police and told them that the body found near the picnic area was known to them. And that was exactly what happened. In 2016, Brian Barker, a local police officer, was caught and charged with penalties for offenses he had committed. When Brian was in custody, he told the police that he had filed a missing persons report in 2006 that had never been addressed. He also added that the torso found in Wright City's picnic spot could be his sister's. Now, this might have been because Brian really loved his sister, or maybe he just wanted to help the police so that he could be relieved of some of the he had committed. Earlier in 2006, Brian Barker had gone to the police and told them that his sister had been missing for two years and that the police should file a report. The police did so. Brian's case was not worked on from then because Brian had no idea where his sister could be and the police had no way of finding her. But Brian Barker's story did not end there. Brian Barker was a notorious police officer. He had committed a lot of offenses on duty and would continue to do so for years to come. During 2009 to 2014, the Edwardsville Police Department received many complaints regarding business-related Berg. These complaints averaged out to be almost 24 a year. Long story short, after the arrest of Brian Barker, these complaints got lowered to almost six a year. It was because Brian, apart from being a corrupt police officer, was also a goon. His trick was to use his police badge to intimidate people and commit fraud or larceny. He was said to have stolen firearms and also committed residential burglaries around the area. For his grievous his conduct, the court ordered a 40-year sentence to the 43-year-old Barker. So maybe it was in Barker's favor to help the police with the unknown torso case so he could try and get some time off his sentence. In 2014, Warren County Sheriff Lt. Matt Schmutz reopened the torso case. In 2016, the police took Brian's DNA sample and tried to match it with the torso. The samples did not match and the police began to suspect that Brian was lying so he could earn goodwill. But Brian insisted that the torso was his sister's and so the police gave Brian's DNA another try. But this time, the police also secured DNA from other members of the family. Again, a new DNA sample was taken from the torso and sent to the labs for testing. DNA sampling is a very tricky process. It could. 
be that a father's and daughter's DNA do not match, but the father's and the niece's DNA matched perfectly. This is what had happened earlier with Brian's DNA. It had not matched the torsos. But now, when the other family members pitched in and gave their samples too, the DNA samples matched. After multiple matches of the DNA samples obtained from the family members, more importantly from Ashley Canner, who was the daughter of Brian's sister, it was confirmed that the torso found did indeed belong to Brian's sister, Diana Denise Howland. But now a bigger problem arose. Diana had no known home and not even a single surname. She had used many surnames as she was married more than once and had five children from different fathers. Diana Denise Howland grew up partly in both Collinsville and Edwardsville. Her father was a banker and a union leader. Her childhood was not naturally deprived, but as she grew older, life became much more cruel towards her. Among other things, she also fell into the gruesome trap of drug addiction. Gradually, she started becoming one of those family members that go out too often and come home very rarely. As an addict, she had no money to support herself. And with the rise in police forces all over America, the buying and selling of drugs also became a costly job. It was inevitable for Diana to fall into poverty. She knew that she would never be able to support her family and thus she never stayed with them. What was more important for Diana was to support herself but with her addiction issues even that was becoming more and more difficult. Poor Diana chose the hardest way to survive. She chose to become a prostitute. Prostitution seemed like the only way for her to survive while buying drugs in a small town. All through her adult life, Diana was involved with many men who would find her explicit jobs so that Diana could make more money. Her job and her lifestyle were both notorious and so Diana also had many run-ins with the police. Due to her habits, she also went to jail multiple times. Her daughter, Ashley Canner, said that Diana's trips to jail were so frequent that it almost became easy for her to survive jail. Diana, whenever she would get out of jail, would make sure to make time for her children and meet them. They would have dinner together and Diana would leave soon after. Ashley, despite being away from her mother for most of her life, cared about Diana deeply and she could tell that Diana loved her too, even though she was hardly around. She said that Diana never forgot her birthday and would call her every year. Before Diana went missing, she promised Ashley to show up for a play Ashley was acting in. But Diana never came back the day after and Ashley knew that something had gone wrong. Howland went by several names, including her maiden name Diana Barker as well as Diana Canner and Diana Froelich. Court documents report that she was born in Belleville, married in 1991 with at least two children before divorcing four years later. Her family couldn't be reached or preferred not to comment. According to Captain Dan DeCarly of the Major Case Squad of Greater St. Louis, Howland led a transient lifestyle and was estranged from her relatives. She was last seen around Granite City and East St. Louis as well as Alton before her disappearance in May 2004. Exploring the ancestry and relations of a missing person isn't new for the State Police of Missouri. Recently, a decade-old case of a missing person named T.J. Emily was solved using the Genetic Genealogy Program. On the night of March 25, 1990, T.J. Emily left his home for a walk, but he never returned. A missing persons case was filed in the same year, but nothing was found just like in the case of Diana. Two years later, on March 7, 1992, a skeleton was found in an old abandoned building. The police tried to identify the DNA of the skeleton but couldn't do so. Years later, the case was reopened and the police collaborated with an NGO called the DNA Doe Project through a rigorous process. After 20 long years, the police found out that the skeleton was T.J. Emily. Another terrible case was solved in 2019 using genetic genealogy. In 1993, nine-year-old Angie Hausman went out of her house but never came back. Her body was discovered in a conservation area near St. Louis nine days after she went missing. She had been left there by her kidnapper to die and ultimately died of asphyxiation as her mouth had been sealed by duct tape. DNA was sampled from the trimmed piece of Angie's underwear and sent to the lab. Years later, using genetic genealogy, the police found out that Angie's killer was one Earl Webster Kakak who had been retired from the Navy. Coming back to Diana's case, a similar thing happened here. Once the police found out that the unknown torso belonged to Diana Delis Howland, they started testing the murderer's DNA that was found on the torso and on the knife that was at the crime scene. DNA was extracted from the lower end of Diana's torso and some was covered from the knife that the police found in the sewer. The police took the DNA sample from the knife in 2019. 
Once the police had secured the DNA, they sent the samples to the lab for testing by researchers at the Genetic Genealogy Program. After constant tests for almost three years and ongoing advancements in genetic genealogy, the police were able to narrow their search gradually. Eventually, they found their man, Mike Clardy. When the police tracked him down, Mike Clardy was living in Maryland Heights with his wife. More importantly, Mike Clardy was blind. But was he blind at the time of Diana's death? No. Mike went blind after a killing of Diana in a totally unrelated incident. While in police custody, Mike confessed that he was the one who killed Diana on the night of June 28, 2004. Now, why did Mike kill Diana? Because it is important to note that Mike wasn't a serial killer, nor was he a criminal. Apart from the Diana case, he had never been in police custody for anything, let alone murder. Then what happened that day? According to Mike's version of the story, Diana came to Mike's house. Diana at that time worked as a prostitute and Mike brought her jobs to be done. Mike at that time lived at the 3500 block on Dixie Drive, St. N. and Diana used to frequent his house. On the night of June 26, 2004, Mike and Diana fell into an argument. The argument surpassed all bounds and Mike's anger surpassed his sanity. Ultimately, Mike killed Diana and dismembered her body. The torso was thrown at the Wright City rest stop and other parts were thrown all around St. Louis County and Warren County. The other parts of Diana's body were never recovered. For Mike's neighbors, it was impossible to see him in this light. They had never imagined the 63-year-old blind man would be behind this. Mike now faces a life sentence and his bail is set at $1 million. As for the family of Diana, it is a sad story after all. Most of her family forgot about her as soon as she went missing. Society always attaches a stigma with drug addicts and prostitutes, but nevertheless, her daughter, Ashley Kinnear, will always remember her mother, Diana, and how she loved her. Ashley was very emotional and overwhelmed when the police caught hold of Diana's killer. At least Ashley, of all people, got her closure. After almost two decades, justice had finally been served thanks to the tireless efforts of law and forensic experts who refused to give up on this case. While it can't bring back Diana and her love for her daughters, it is a reminder for all killers that they can't hide away forever and will always be found guilty of their heinous acts. Share your opinions in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Today takes us to Opelika, the county seat of Lee County in the east central part of the U.S. state of Alabama. It is here in this town that is home to over 30,000 people that a chilling discovery was made in 2012. Opelika police were called to Brookhaven Trailer Park in Opelika, Alabama on January 28, 2012 regarding the discovery of skeletal remains. The bones were found in a wooded area behind a trailer and the adjacent lot while a skull was located in a yard. Along with the remains, a child's pink shirt and curly hair were also found. The FBI laboratory in Quantico performed a medical examination on the remains and concluded that they belonged to a young African-American girl likely between the ages of 4 to 7, who came to be known as the Opelika baby Jane Doe by the community. The autopsy conducted on the remains revealed more than 15 fractures to her skull, arms, legs, shoulders, and ribs that were caused by blunt force trauma. She was possibly underweight and had lost vision in her left eye due to a fracture, the medical examiner further stated. Her death was determined to be a homicide and it was estimated to have happened between 2010 and 2011. The detectives evaluated more than 15,000 case files, which indicated that they had been meticulously examining all available evidence related to the case. These included previous reports of missing children, crime scene investigations, witness statements, and other relevant information. In addition to evaluating case files, the detectives had also looked into tens of thousands of leads. They had been actively gathering information from a variety of sources such as tips from the public, surveillance footage, and interviews with potential or suspects. To aid in their investigation, the detectives worked with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which was a nonprofit organization that provided assistance to law enforcement agencies in cases involving missing or exploited children. They also collaborated with numerous other agencies, which included local and federal law enforcement, forensic experts, and social service providers. On June 14, 2012, the officials made public a three-dimensional model that depicted the possible appearance of the girl, which was derived from the analysis of her skeletal remains. Six years later, in March 2018, the police were still urging the public to provide any information to identify baby Jane Doe. 
it was reported that Governor K. Ivey had agreed to grant a reward of up to $5,000 to anyone who could offer information leading to an arrest or the resolution of the case. A day later, the reward amount increased to $10,000 after a local citizen generously agreed to match the governor's reward. In March 2018, it was reported by investigators that they had been working on the case daily with the hope of providing closure. Opelika Police Chief John McKitchen said that it had been a continued concerted effort on the part of several different law enforcement agencies. It was revealed through isotope testing in the case that the young girl who was believed to be between four and seven years old was indeed from the southeastern region. Sergeant Alfred White of the Opelika Police Department stated that they had talked to the pediatric clinic and the hospital attempting to obtain birth records and anything else that could help identify the child. He further commented that they needed to determine her identity, arrange for a proper burial, and solve the case. White expressed his disbelief that after six years, nobody knew who this child was. Exciting news broke out in October 2022 when DNA genealogy helped investigators finally solve the mystery surrounding Baby Jane Doe's father. Baby Jane Doe's father was identified as Lamar Vickerstaff. He was born in the city of Opelika, where he also spent his formative years. He ultimately decided to enlist in the U.S. Navy, which allowed him to serve in a variety of locations, including Norfolk, Virginia, Honolulu in the stunning state of Hawaii, and the seaside city of Jacksonville. The police were able to track down Lamar Vickerstaff. However, when they visited the Vickerstaff's home in Jacksonville, Florida, they were met with a shocking revelation. Lamar refused to disclose any details about the baby, leaving the investigators scrambling for answers. Ruth Vickerstaff, Lamar's wife, also denied any knowledge of the child or her mother, throwing the case into further disarray. In December of 2022, the case that had been shrouded in mystery for so long finally had another breakthrough. Investigators had been tirelessly working to piece together the identity of the young girl's biological mother, and finally, they had some leads. After narrowing down the possible matches, they discovered a woman by the name of Sherry Wiggins to be the girl's birth mother. But that wasn't all. Sherry Wiggins confirmed that she had, in fact, given birth to the child in January of 2006 and named her Amore Jovia Wiggins. This revelation was like a ray of sunlight shining down on the long and dark road that investigators had been on, they finally had a solid lead to follow. However, there was still more to the story. When she was just 19 years old, Sherry Wiggins crossed paths with Lamar Vickerstaff, who was 35 and serving in the Navy. They eventually moved in together after finding out she was pregnant, but Vickerstaff's family wasn't happy about their unwed status, which didn't stop Sherry from making the relationship work. She gave birth to the child in January 2006 and named her Amore Jovia Wiggins. Wiggins realized things were getting dangerous when Vickerstaff became physical with her during an argument. She moved out, but Vickerstaff didn't step up to be a father to their child. Wiggins took him to court for child support but later had a change of heart due to her own legal issues. She believed her daughter would be better off with her dad and stepmother. She claimed that by 2013, the court had notified her that all of her appeals had been heard. Sherry claims that since 2009, she has been obligated to pay child support and the only way she could maintain contact with her daughter was to do so. Wiggins expressed that she had felt that they had made her feel so bad about herself and that despite her efforts, the doors had kept being closed. She also mentioned that she had felt like the best she could do was to live out her financial obligation, which she had never stopped doing. Wiggins added that she had thought that one day she could tell her daughter that she had never given up on her and that all she could do was to take care of her financially, which was what she had done. She further stated that if she couldn't do anything else, she could still support her child financially. Sherry had no idea that her daughter was in danger. She believed Lamar and Ruth Vickerstaff had brainwashed Amore to hate her, but she had planned to rekindle their relationship when she turned 18. Regrettably, that didn't happen. In short, this was a crucial turning point in the investigation, a moment of both relief and curiosity. Finally, there was a name to put to the face of the young girl and a starting point for investigators to unravel the mysteries of her past. Detectives went on a mission to uncover the truth about baby Amore's disappearance, contacting schools and pediatric clinics across multiple states where the Vickerstaffs had resided. Shockingly, they discovered that Amore had never been registered in school or reported missing. This discovery raised more questions than answers, especially in light of the DNA reports that revealed previous injuries on the baby's body indicating that she had been abused and neglected. 
On January 17, 2023, Lamar Vickerstaff Jr., the victim's father, and his wife, Ruth Kenyatta Vickerstaff, aged 53, were charged with murder in connection to the death of Amore Wiggins. The details of the case are both shocking and disturbing. Despite living in multiple states over the years, detectives discovered that the couple never enrolled the victim Amore, Lamar's own daughter, in school or reported her as a missing person. As a result, warrants were issued for their arrests. The absence of any criminal history for the Vickerstaffs in Duval County court records made the case even more baffling. During a press conference, Opelika Police Chief Shane Healy couldn't contain his emotions as he praised the tireless efforts of everyone involved in bringing resolution to this tragic case. The case was then brought to the Lee County District Attorney's Office where prosecutors decided there was enough evidence to charge Mr. and Mrs. Vickerstaff in Amore's death. The couple was arrested for failure to report a missing child and then were waiting for extradition to Alabama. The nation is left reeling from this devastating news and justice must be served for baby Amore. Following their subsequent court appearances, the pair was ordered jailed without bond. Police said they have 10 days to pick them up from Florida jail after they waived extradition. After their arrest, the couple found themselves in a courtroom for their initial hearing. Ruth Vickerstaff was hit with a $10,000 bond and ordered to remain in the state of Alabama until her preliminary hearing on March 22, 2023. In the meantime, she secured the legal expertise of Zach Alsobrook, who revealed that Ruth was forthcoming and fully cooperative during her more than two hours with the police. Ruth's relatives showed up to support her, but they were tight-lipped and refused to talk to the press from WRBL. Meanwhile, Lamar Vickerstaff faced the same judge and was denied bond. His hearing to discuss bond was taking place on January 30, 2023, at 3.30, and a court-appointed attorney to handle the defense. Although this attorney didn't have anything to say to the media, also Brooke did speak up, sharing that Ruth had been completely transparent with law enforcement. On January 30th, Judge Tickle refused to grant bail for Lamar Vickerstaff after listening to the presented evidence. The charge against him was the felony murder of a child who had suffered long-term and severe injuries. Despite the absence of records, the evidence suggested that the injuries were sustained over a period of time. In addition, Vickerstaff went AWOL right after the charges were filed against him and he had connections both within and outside the United States. While Vickerstaff shook his head in disbelief, Judge Tickle made the decision to deny him bail at that time. In conclusion, it is important to note that this case is still an ongoing investigation and the Opelika Police Department Detective Division encourages anyone with any information regarding this case to come forward and provide their assistance. It is essential to remember that until Lamar and Ruth are proven guilty in a court of law, they are to be considered innocent. The mere thought that Lamar allegedly committed such a heinous crime of killing his own daughter is incredibly sickening and serving. As the investigation unfolds, authorities are working tirelessly to uncover the truth and ensure that justice is served for the victim and her family. Let's hope that with the community's help, the perpetrators will be brought to justice and held accountable for their actions. Lexington, situated in central North Carolina, is a city with a population of 18,931 and is the county seat of Davidson County. The city is located 20 miles south of Winston-Salem and is renowned for its rich cultural heritage in barbecue and furniture making. It is here in Lexington that our next story begins. Mary Davis, a 29-year-old mother of two from Lexington, North Carolina, was employed at Lanier Hardware, where she worked tirelessly to provide for her family. Her dedication to her job was apparent in her commitment to delivering exceptional service to customers, ensuring that they had everything they needed for their projects. But Mary's story is more than just one of hard work and dedication. Her experiences and struggles are a testament to the resilience and strength of the human spirit. Despite facing various challenges in her personal life, Mary remains steadfast in her determination to provide a better future for her children. Her colleagues and customers alike were drawn to her infectious personality and positive attitude, making her a beloved member of the community. Mary's ability to connect with others and make them feel heard and understood set her apart and made her an invaluable asset to Lanier Hardware. In summary, Mary Davis was not just a hardworking employee at Lanier Hardware. She was a dedicated mother, a beloved member of the community, and a shining example of perseverance in the face of adversity. It was May 30, 1987, when Mary Davis was last seen at the Lexington Lanier's Ace Hardware store, where she had been working for a while. She had taken her lunch break and was expected to return to work, but she never did. 
Her family grew increasingly worried as the hours passed by without any word from her. However, the news that they received the following day was nothing short of devastating. The police informed Mary's family that her lifeless body had been discovered and she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. The culprit had mercilessly taken her life and left her to die behind when Dixie, a food and pharmacy store that was at the time at 802 East Center Street, a 20-minute walk from Davis's work, it was a tragedy that shook the small town to its core. Mary was a beloved member of the community and her sudden and brutal death left everyone reeling with shock and grief. For the next three decades, the case remained unsolved, leaving behind a lingering sense of injustice and a haunting reminder of the fragility of life. At the time of the homicide, the investigators painstakingly collected all the evidence they could, hoping to find a clue that would lead them to the perpetrator. However, despite their best efforts, they were unable to make any headway in the case. Some DNA they found at the scene of the crime seemed promising, but unfortunately, the technology and DNA advancements available at the time were not advanced enough to unlock its secrets. The investigators were deeply frustrated, knowing that they were holding potentially valuable information that they could not decipher. However, they were wise enough to recognize that technology was advancing at an exponential pace and that it was only a matter of time before new breakthroughs would allow them to unlock the secrets of the evidence they had collected. So they carefully stored the evidence away, knowing that it could be a critical piece of the puzzle in the future. They knew that the day would come when new techniques and technologies would enable them to uncover the truth about the crime and bring the perpetrator to justice. 34 years went by and the evidence remained untouched and undisturbed, waiting patiently for the day when it would finally be analyzed. Finally, the day came when new DNA technologies and forensic techniques emerged and the investigators eagerly took the evidence out of storage. As part of a collaboration with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation, Othram, a company specializing in genetic genealogy DNA analysis, provided a detailed explanation of the methodology employed in the case. According to their official statement, in the year 2020, DNA evidence was sent to Hotham Incorporated to investigate an unknown male suspect. The experts at Otham utilized forensic-grade genome sequencing to generate a comprehensive genealogical profile from the available DNA sample. Once the profile was constructed, Otham's genealogy experts analyzed it thoroughly to derive leads for the ongoing investigation. These leads were then provided to the investigators for further follow-up. As a result of the investigation, the suspect was identified and brought to justice. Therefore, it can be concluded that the expertise of Othram in collaboration with the investigators played a vital role in the successful resolution of the case. On February 8, 2023, the Lexington Police Department made a major breakthrough in a cold case that had haunted them for 36 years. Thanks to the advances in DNA technology, they were finally able to identify the suspect in the brutal murder of Mary Davis. The investigation had been stalled for decades, but the DNA evidence collected all those years ago provided the key to unlocking the case. After analyzing the evidence, authorities were able to positively identify the perpetrator as Russell Grantwood. Unfortunately, justice could not be fully served in this case, as Wood had passed away in 2013. However, District Attorney Gary Frank made it clear that if Wood were still alive, he would be facing charges of first-degree murder, first-degree kidnapping, and first-degree rape. The details of Wood's relationship with Mary Davis remain murky. What is known, according to Lexington Chief of Police Robbie Rummidge, is that the two were not strangers to each other. It's a tragic and unsettling reminder that danger can sometimes come from those closest to us. According to Rummage, there is no known motive and any speculation regarding it would be mere conjecture. On February 3, 2023, Davis's family received information about the news conference being held. Lori Martin, Davis's niece, shared during the news conference that they had been praying for years to find the person responsible for Mary's death. She expressed that the new information brought a sense of closure to the family even though it could never bring Mary back. Tracy Cleary, Davis's daughter, wrote a beautiful poem in honor of her mother, which was read aloud at the news conference. In the poem, Tracy expressed her deep love for her mother and how much she missed her. She also shared her belief that they would be reunited in heaven one day. Mary's family had been eagerly looking forward to celebrating her 65th birthday with a joyous memorial service. The event was intended to honor the cherished memories of Mary and the profound influence she had on the lives of her loved ones. The murder of a loved one is one of the most traumatic events that a family can endure. The pain and grief can be overwhelming, and the lingering question of who is responsible can haunt a family for years. 
For Mary's family, the mystery surrounding the murder of their beloved mother was finally solved thanks to advances in DNA testing. The news brought them a sense of closure and a relief that they had been yearning for. They took comfort in knowing who the perpetrator was. They were grateful for the tireless work of law enforcement, the advancements in forensic science, and the closure it brought to their family. While the pain of their loss will never completely fade, they can finally find peace in knowing the truth and honoring their mother's memory. Our next case takes us to Los Angeles, one of the most well-known cities in the world, home to Hollywood and a great many stars. LA is the hub of Western entertainment, but with fame and celebrity also comes a darker side, and it was here in 1990 that a terrible crime took place. William Arnold Newton, born on July 26, 1965, had a career in the entertainment industry where he worked as an actor, director, producer, beautician, and set decorator. He performed in adult films with a focus on homosexual content, using the aliases Billy London and Billy Porter. Additionally, he produced such films under the name Bill E. London. Sadly, Newton was violently murdered and his case gained notoriety as one of Hollywood's most infamous unsolved homicides. Newton was born in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and attended school there until he moved to Ladysmith in 1979. In 1980, he and his mother relocated to Oklahoma City after his freshman year of high school. According to family accounts, Newton moved to California in 1984 and was working in the music video industry, doing makeup and choreography at the time of his murder. His father described him as a smart young man who was beginning to establish himself and make a good living, but also as someone who was restless and trying to find his way. Newton left home at 16 and traveled around the U.S. for three years before settling in Los Angeles in 1985, where he earned his GED in 1989. His friends viewed him primarily as a poet and artist and noted that he only worked on adult material for financial reasons. Newton's time at the Hollywood spot was just the beginning of his journey in the entertainment industry. His relationship with David Ray not only opened doors for him in the adult film industry, but also sparked a creative partnership that would lead to the founding of London Ray Productions. As a producer, makeup artist, and set designer at London Ray, Newton honed his skills and gained valuable experience in the business. His passion for the art of filmmaking was apparent, and he quickly made a name for himself in the industry. Despite his success, Newton began to feel a pull to leave the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles behind and start anew. He found himself yearning for a change of pace, a new environment, and a fresh start. And so he set his sights on the bright lights of Las Vegas. By October 1990, Newton had already begun making plans to move to Sin City. Perhaps he was drawn to the glitz and glamour of the famous strip, or maybe he simply craved the desert sun and dry heat of the Mojave Desert. Whatever his reasons, one thing was certain, Newton was ready for a new chapter in his life. With his talent and passion for the arts, there was no doubt that Newton would continue to thrive in his new home. The move to Las Vegas was to mark the beginning of an exciting new chapter in his journey, filled with new opportunities, challenges, and adventures. Newton was last seen at the Rage nightclub in West Hollywood. Sadly, on October 29, 1990, he was discovered to have been kidnapped and brutally murdered. His body was dismembered and his head and feet were found in a dumpster on Santa Monica Boulevard in Los Angeles. A tragic and disturbing end to his life. His murder had gone unsolved for more than three decades. And for most of that period, it looked like it would remain unsolved forever until now. The murder of Billy Newton, also known as London, remained a mystery for over 30 years, leaving his family grieving and desperate for justice. Despite their prayers and the efforts of law enforcement, it seemed as though the case would never be solved. However, a glimmer of hope emerged when an unlikely group of individuals came together to share notes and investigate the crime. This team consisted of LAPD detective John Lambert, documentarian Rachel Mason, and Christopher Rice and Eric Shawquin, who co-host the Dinner Party Show podcast. Through their years of painstaking research and dedication, they were finally able to uncover the truth about London's murder. The journey began when one of the team members, Rice, received a tip that London had been seen leaving a Los Angeles club on the night of his death with someone who resembled Jeffrey Dahmer. As Rice and Quinn delved deeper into the case and reported on their findings through their podcast, they struggled to identify the culprit behind London's death. They even entertained the possibility that Dahmer himself may have been involved, although the serial killer had previously denied any involvement. However, it ultimately became clear that Dahmer had nothing to do with London's murder and the real story would eventually come to light. 
about the same time Mason was doing her own work on the cold case. During the course of her investigation and documentary-style reporting, Clark Williams, a stay-at-home father, contacted her. He intended to provide Mason with some background information about what Billy's upbringing in Wisconsin would have been like. Clark was a native of the same region as Billy and was familiar with its small-town atmosphere. Williams and Mason began to deep dive into the case after realizing they shared a strong passion for it. The stay-at-home father described how he and the videographer started to use every bit of spare time they had to try and solve the case in an interview with Tufab. Williams stated that they had nurtured a growing obsession to study and investigate every single aspect of the case and to leave no stone unturned. According to a report by the Times, Williams expressed his interest in the case due to the striking similarities between himself and the victim, Billy Newton. Williams and Newton were both gay men who were born in the same week of the same year, 1965, and grew up in northern Wisconsin before moving to bigger cities. Williams' involvement in the case began when he joined a Facebook group called The History of Gay Wisconsin in December 2021. It was there that he stumbled upon a post about Newton's murder which immediately captured his attention. He felt a strong pull to get involved in the case in whatever capacity he could. William told the Times that he was particularly interested in helping to tell Newton's story as he believed that Newton's life was representative of the experience of many gay men and teenagers during that era. He hoped that by shedding light on Newton's story he could help to raise awareness about the struggles faced by LGBTQ plus individuals during that time period. After months of exhaustive research into the gay adult film industry of the late 1980s, journalist Ben Williams stumbled upon a potential breakthrough, the elusive actor, Billy Houston. However, as Williams dug deeper into the actor's past, he uncovered a shocking revelation. Houston's real name was Daryl Lynn Madden, a self-proclaimed white supremacist with a dark history of violence. To elaborate, Williams learned more from a Facebook group and eventually managed to track down Rick Paquet, who was the local investigator to delve into the case when the police were unable to solve it. Pascal, who owned an escape shop in West Hollywood, was also discovered by Williams to be a gay adult film producer who went by the name Richard Lawrence during the same period that Newton was involved in the industry. Through her research on Paquet and Newton, Williams came across Houston's name, which eventually led her to Madden. Madden, now a trans woman, had pleaded guilty in 2008 to the kidnapping and murder of Stephen Domer and her accomplice Bradley Qualls in Oklahoma City. She claimed that they had been attempting to initiate themselves into the Chaos Squad skinheads gang by killing a gay man. They lured Billy to a secluded area where they beat and strangled him with his own coat hanger. Madden then shot and killed Qualls before fleeing the scene and was later arrested by the police. But just as Williams thought his investigation had reached a dead end, fate intervened. Madden had been arrested and had pleaded guilty to the murder of another gay man, a coincidence that Williams simply could not ignore. The stay-at-home dad was determined to uncover the truth. As Williams spoke to the Los Angeles Times about his findings, one thing became clear. The second murder had only intensified his focus on Madden. With each new piece of information, Williams was one step closer to unraveling the mystery of Billy London. As Williams delved deeper into his investigation, he stumbled upon a crucial piece of evidence. A decades-old interview with Madden for a book titled American Honor Killings. In this interview, Madden made a shocking confession. He claimed to have committed another murder in Los Angeles. This discovery was alarming, and Williams knew he had to act fast. Realizing the gravity of the situation, Williams wasted no time in reaching out to Detective Lambert with the newfound information. Lambert, an experienced detective, was quick to recognize the significance of this development and began to conduct a thorough investigation into Madden. Lambert and his partner, Mames, were determined to solve the case of Newton's murder, but they had hit a dead end after years of investigation. Just when they had given up hope, a new lead emerged thanks to Williams' tips. The detectives were once again fired up with renewed energy and enthusiasm to crack the case. Their investigation led them to Madden, the last person known to have seen Newton alive. They discovered that she worked for a company located on Santa Monica Boulevard, which was just a stone's throw away from the alley where Newton's body was found. This was a major breakthrough in the case, and Lambert and Mises wasted no time in following up on the lead. According to Detective Lambert, Madden, who was previously an actor, is currently imprisoned in Oklahoma, serving a life sentence for murder. Madden now identifies as a transgender woman, an Orthodox Jew, and goes by the name Darylin. In January, Detective Lambert and his partner traveled to Oklahoma to interview Darylin. 
Lambert said that they were talking to a person who had swastika tattoos and was also wearing a knitted pink yarmulke. Lambert added that the person they were talking to was a gay film actor, transgender skinhead, Nazi Orthodox Jew, and remarked that if one were to write that down in a sentence, it would be like saying, what? During the discussion about the case involving Newton, Madden eventually came clean and revealed that she and her group of skinhead friends had intentionally singled out the young actor with the intention of robbing him and inflicting physical harm. According to Madden, Newton appeared to be under the influence of drugs and later tested positive for methamphetamine in his system after leaving the nightclub. Lamberti asked Madden if he had any accomplices or if he knew where the rest of London's body had been taken to which Madden refused to provide any further information, stating that she was a murderer but not a snitch. Lamberti believed that the circumstances and Newton's confession were sufficient to present the case to Gaskin's office, but they refused to file charges due to a lack of evidence. The New York Post reached out to Gaskin's office for comment but did not receive an immediate response, and Madden's representative was unavailable for comment. Although the Los Angeles District Attorney chose not to press charges against Madden purportedly due to insufficient evidence beyond his confession, Lambert confirmed that his department is formally ending the inquiry with the consent of Newton's family. This suggests that while the DA did not find the evidence compelling enough to pursue legal action, the investigators involved in the case still believe that Madden may have been responsible for Newton's death. Nonetheless, given the lack of evidence, they have decided to cease the investigation, recognizing that there is no longer a viable path forward to pursue justice for the victim and their family. Williams, Mason, Rice, and Quinn are actively engaged in trying to identify the people who are suspected to have assisted Madden in carrying out Newton's murder. These individuals are determined to uncover the identities of these accomplices and bring them to justice. Despite any obstacles they may encounter along the way, they remain committed to their pursuit of the truth and ensuring that all responsible parties are held accountable for their actions. As the 30th anniversary of the unsolved murder of William Newton approached in 2020, Christopher Rice and Eric Shawquin, who are producers and best-selling authors for the New York Times, covered the case on their podcast. TDPS presents Christopher and Eric in episode 37. They established an email address to receive tips and information related to the case. On episode 48, they revealed an account of a potential eyewitness who claimed to have seen Newton alive at the nightclub rage in West Hollywood before he left with a man who resembled the serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer. Their podcast about the case caught the attention of the LAPD homicide detective in charge of the case who contacted Rice and Quinn in January 2021. In February 2021, the detective gave an interview on another episode of the podcast. On April 25, 2021, director Rachel Mason appeared on the podcast and revealed that she was working on a documentary about the case. William expressed humility and gratitude at having been involved in the discovery of the killer or killers responsible for the brutal murder of a young man in October of 1990. He conveyed his appreciation for the opportunity to provide some measure of justice and closure to the victim's many loved ones and friends. This sentiment was shared with two fab after the Los Angeles Times published a story about the case. Rice and Quinn expressed their gratitude and humility to be part of the group of amateur detectives who contributed to solving the Billy Newton murder case after 30 years. They shared on Twitter that when they initially presented the case on their podcast, they hoped that one day they could help bring justice to the victim and their family. Furthermore, Rice and Quinn promised their audience that they would continue to provide more coverage on the case in upcoming episodes of their podcast. This indicates that they are dedicated to shedding light on the case and bringing awareness to the issue. Overall, Rice and Quinn's dedication to the case and their desire to continue covering it on their platform demonstrate their commitment to uncovering the truth and seeking justice. The sister who was mourning her brother's death was seeking answers regarding the reason for the crime and the whereabouts of the remaining parts of his body that have not been found yet. However, Madden did not provide any further details regarding the missing body parts. The Redford is a charter township in Wayne County in the U.S. state of Michigan. Its official name is the Charter Township of Redford. The city of Detroit and the township are separated by a shared eastern border. In 2020, there were 49,504 people living there. Our next case takes us to this peaceful little town. Christina Castiglione was a 19-year-old resident of Redford who lived with her parents. She had recently graduated Redford Union High School and was known to be very active in sports. Despite not being married, she was in a committed relationship with her steady boyfriend. 
Castiglione was employed at the Detroit Edison Company as a clerk in the research department, indicating her interest in pursuing a career in the field of science. Prior to her sudden disappearance, Castiglione had reportedly contacted an army suggesting that she may have been considering joining the military. On March 21, 1983, the mother of 19-year-old Christina Castiglione reported her missing in Redford Township, Michigan. A week later, on March 29, 1983, the Livingston County Sheriff's Office received a tip that led them to the discovery of Castiglione's body in the Oak Grove State Game area located at the corner of Fawcett and Fisher Roads in Livingston County's Deerfield Township. The state in which Castiglione's body was found was alarming. Her body was partially clothed and located in a remote wooded area. Upon investigating the scene, detectives found evidence that indicated Castiglione had been strangled to death and sexually assaulted. This discovery shook the community and triggered a widespread investigation to find the perpetrator responsible for Castiglione's death. The brutal nature of her death left many in the community feeling unsafe and fearing for their own safety. During the autopsy in 1983, the medical examiner found male DNA that was collected and preserved in the hopes of making a breakthrough in the future. In response to the discovery of male DNA during the autopsy, Livingston County Sheriff Mike Murphy expressed appreciation for the diligent efforts of law enforcement personnel who initially responded to the scene in 1983. He praised the preservation of evidence and the thorough processing of the crime scene, stating that these efforts were essential in ensuring that the DNA evidence discovered during the autopsy could be analyzed and potentially lead to new information about the case. Sheriff Murphy emphasized that the investigation into this case would continue with a renewed focus and that the discovery of male DNA represented a significant development that could potentially lead to a breakthrough in the case. He also expressed his gratitude to the medical examiner and the forensic scientists who were able to extract and preserve the DNA evidence after all these years. In the early 2000s, the Michigan State Police Crim Lab entered the samples into CODIS, but unfortunately, they were unable to identify any suspects. However, the case did not remain forgotten. The Livingston County Sheriff's Office cold case team, comprising young, retired FBI agent Bob Getchman, retired Mackinac Island Police Chief Bill Langahan, retired Livingston County Detective Edward Moore, and Detective Lieutenant Jim Lynch took up the challenge of investigating the case as well as several others. Their efforts were fueled by a determination to bring closure to these cases, and they painstakingly sifted through the evidence, leaving no stone unturned. Despite encountering numerous setbacks along the way, they remained undaunted, relentlessly pursuing the truth. According to a statement made by a county official named Young about a decade or so ago, the cost of the genealogical profiling process was estimated to be around $100,000, which was considered too high for the county to afford at that time. However, over the years, the cost has been significantly reduced and the county was finally able to pursue it in March of 2020. The process was implemented thanks to a grant they received. The genealogical profiling was carried out by Othram, a company that has an in-house genealogical team with expertise in producing leads based on genealogical data. The leads generated by Othram were then passed on to the Livingston County Cold Case Team, which used the information to further investigate the Castiglione murder case. In May 2022, the use of genealogical profiling by Afram and the subsequent collaboration with the Livingston County Cold Case Team played a crucial role in the investigation of the Castiglione murder case, enabling them to gather valuable information and evidence that helped them to make progress in the case. The investigation conducted by law enforcement officials led to the identification of a suspect named Charles Shaw. This identification was made possible through three separate familial DNA comparison tests that were conducted as part of the investigation. The tests were able to establish a genetic link between Shaw and a living uncle of his. Once the link was established, law enforcement officials were able to build a family tree that helped them narrow down the possible suspects. They discovered that based on the genetic profile of the suspect, Charles Shaw, he was likely a nephew of the uncle who shared the same chromosome. However, the investigation also identified other nephews who did not match the DNA evidence. This left law enforcement officials with two possible scenarios. The suspect could either be a brother or a son of the uncle. Further investigation was conducted to try and establish which of the two possibilities was more likely. According to a statement from the sheriff's office, they recently sought out living relatives of a suspect named Charles Shaw in order to obtain target samples for analysis. 
The samples were analyzed by Afram and came back with a 100% match, confirming that Shaw's living brother and son are indeed related to him as siblings and father-slash-son, respectively. When Shaw's brother was informed of this news, he was reportedly shocked and had no idea about his brother's alleged involvement in any crimes. It's worth noting that Shaw's brother was older and had been serving in the military during the time that Shaw's alleged crimes were said to have taken place. So he may not have been aware of everything that was going on in Shaw's life at the time. The sheriff's office had also shared some information about Shaw's personal life based on what they were told by his family. They stated that he was a sex addict who had a disturbing life and he struggled with mental illness as well as his gender identity. This information may shed some light on the possible motivations behind his alleged criminal behavior. According to a press release from the sheriff's office, Charles Shaw had a history of interacting with law enforcement from a young age. One of the incidents that was noted in the release occurred in 1981 when Shaw was arrested for attempted abduction. Specifically, he allegedly tried to abduct a woman who was in the parking lot of a McDonald's restaurant in Fowlerville. It's unclear from the information provided in the release what the outcome of this particular incident was, for example, whether Shaw was convicted of the attempted abduction or what kind of punishment he may have received. However, the fact that he had this kind of interaction with law enforcement at a young age may be seen as a red flag in hindsight given the more serious allegations that have been made against him in recent years. In 1973, Shaw was taken into custody by the Livonia Police Department on suspicion of breaking and entering. For years later, in 1977, he was arrested again by the LPD, this time for possessing drugs. In 1981, according to sources cited by Young, Shaw was found guilty of an incident that occurred in Fowlerville and was sentenced to serve two weeks in jail and placed on probation. Then in 1982, he found himself on the wrong side of the law once more when he was apprehended for stealing women's shoes from a Kmart store. These events demonstrate a pattern of criminal behavior over the course of several years, indicating that Shaw may have had ongoing issues with the law. During a news conference, Livingston County Sheriff Michael Murphy expressed his skepticism towards the sentence given to David Shaw for the assault of Castiglione, whose death was recently reclassified as a homicide. The sheriff believed that the sentence was too light for what he perceives as aggravated assault, but acknowledged that he did not have all the details of the case from back then. As part of the investigation, police interviewed Shaw's former wife who disclosed that he had confided in her about struggling with his gender identity in 1980 to 1981 and seeking counseling to undergo a sex change. However, investigators have not found any connection between Shaw and Castiglione or between Shaw and the Deerfield area where her body was found. Unfortunately, Shaw passed away in 1983 from accidental sexual asphyxiation, so he cannot be held accountable for Castiglione's death in the court system. Sheriff Murphy expressed his disappointment that justice cannot be served in this case due to Shaw's death. But the investigation will continue to gather more information and bring closure to the victim's family. The cooperation of the Shaw family played a crucial role in identifying the perpetrator of the homicide of Christina Castiglione, Charles Shaw. This statement was released by law enforcement officials who expressed their gratitude to the Shaw family for their cooperation during the investigation. The officials emphasized that the involvement of the Shaw family was instrumental in the successful outcome of the investigation. By working together with law enforcement, they were able to uncover critical evidence that led to the identification of the suspect. The release further highlighted that the use of genealogical DNA was a critical tool in solving this case. The officials expressed hope that this innovative technology will continue to aid law enforcement agencies in advancing their efforts to achieve justice for victims of violent crimes. In addition, the officials acknowledged the long wait for justice that the surviving family members of Christina Castiglione and other victims of unsolved crimes have had to endure. They expressed the hope that the resolution of this case would provide some measure of closure for these families and help bring them some peace of mind. Overall, the release conveyed the importance of collaboration between law enforcement and the community in solving crimes and emphasized the crucial role that technology and cooperation play in achieving justice for victims. On February 24, 2000, the body of 37-year-old mother, Linda Fields, was found brutally strangled to death in the front yard of a residence situated at 1132 Lake Avenue in Racine, Wisconsin. At the time, the lack of evidence and leads meant that investigators had very little to work with and the case would go cold for over two decades and was only solved as recently as 2023. 
In this video, we'll explore the twists and turns of this intriguing murder mystery and how the pieces finally came together, leading to closure for Linda's loved ones and the community. Who was responsible for Linda's tragic death? How did they find the perpetrator? Racine is a city in Wisconsin, USA, and is the county seat of Racine County. It is located at the mouth of the Root River on the shore of Lake Michigan. Racine is about 22 miles south of Milwaukee and around 60 miles north of Chicago. It is the primary city in the Racine metropolitan area, which is part of the Milwaukee Combined Statistical Area. According to the 2020 U.S. Census, the population of Racine is 77,816, making it the fifth largest city in Wisconsin. In January 2017, it was named the most affordable place to live in the world by the Demographia International Housing Affordability Survey. It is here in Racine that our story begins in 2000. On February 24th, in the year 2000, the lifeless body of a 37-year-old woman was discovered in the front yard of a residence situated at 1132 Lake Avenue in Racine, Wisconsin. The body was found beneath a pine tree with low-hanging branches by an individual out walking their dog in the early hours of the morning who immediately reported it to the police. When police arrived at the crime scene, they identified the victim as Linda Fields. The Milwaukee Physical Examiner's Office conducted an autopsy, which revealed that Miss Fields had been strangled to death. They also collected unknown DNA samples from the body. The victim's body was found in a helpless state deprived of any chance of survival. Such a gruesome act of violence left a permanent mark on the memories of those involved and the surrounding community. In May 2001, Sharon Polakowski, the medical examiner on the case, authored a lab report on multiple DNA samples that were collected, which indicated that all samples came from a single unknown male contributor and were identical. Despite entering the DNA profile into the casework index of the Wisconsin DNA Data Bank, Wisconsin Convicted Felons Database, and National DNA Database, no match was found at the time. The lead investigator at the time, investigator Steve Mitch, interviewed numerous witnesses but was unable to make an arrest. In March 2005, as part of an ongoing negation, a decision was made to re-examine samples that had been previously collected but not yet analyzed. The hope was that these samples might yield new leads or information that could help move the investigation forward. After conducting further tests on these samples, it was discovered that one of them contained male DNA. This was an important discovery as it provided a potential clue about the perpetrator of the crime in question. Upon further analysis, it was determined that the male DNA profile found on the sample was identical to the DNA profiles that had been previously identified. This finding added weight to the existing evidence and suggested that the male individual in question had been involved in the crime. This discovery was a significant breakthrough in the investigation and provided investigators with a new avenue to pursue in their quest for justice. Although the case was reassigned in 2005 and then again in 2020, no significant progress was made until the DNA of five suspects was compared with the unknown male DNA, and all five were eventually eliminated as suspects. Despite extensive efforts to solve the case, the identity of the unknown male DNA contributor remained a mystery. Eventually, as time went on with no new leads to follow, the case went cold. During August of 2020, Chief Art Howell made the decision to reopen the investigation into the death of Linda Fields, which had remained unsolved for several years. The chief hoped that by re-examining the case with fresh eyes, new evidence or leads might be covered that could help to finally solve this long-standing mystery. Consequently, he instructed the investigation's unit to prioritize the case and give it the attention it deserved. To carry out this renewed investigation, the task of reviewing the case was assigned to investigator Chris Blackmore in September 2020. Blackmore was selected for his extensive experience in the field of criminal investigations and his ability to analyze evidence and identify potential suspects. In order to further strengthen the team, he was also assisted by Special Agent Neil McGrath who brought his own unique skills and expertise from the Wisconsin Department Justice Division of Criminal Investigations. Together, Investigator Blackmore and Special Agent McGrath worked tirelessly to comb through the existing evidence and follow up on any potential leads. They utilized the latest forensic technologies and conducted interviews with witnesses and persons of interest to gain a comprehensive understanding of the case. In April of 2021, Investigator Blackmore sought the assistance of several law enforcement professionals, including DCI Special Agent McGrath, FBI Agent Sarah Dimron and DNA analyst Natalie Fisher of the State of Wisconsin Crime Lab. 
After analyzing the DNA evidence collected from the crime scene, Fisher determined that there was enough DNA extract to proceed with an investigative genetic genealogy IgG, analysis. The Wisconsin Crime Lab also had the capability to move forward with the familial search analysis, which involves comparing the DNA sample to DNA profiles of family members in a database. In May of 2021, the DNA evidence was sent to AuthorRAM, a company specializing in forensic DNA analysis. AuthorRAM scientists use a technique called forensic-grade genome sequencing to produce a comprehensive genealogical profile from the DNA sample. The profile was then sent back to the FBI where the genealogy team used it to conduct further genetic genealogy research. The process of genetic genealogy involves comparing the DNA profile to other profiles in public and private databases to identify potential relatives of the individual whose DNA was collected. This process can help law enforcement agencies identify suspects in criminal investigations by tracing their familial relationships. With the genealogical profile provided by AuthorRAM, the FBI's genealogy team was able to advance the investigation and identify potential suspects in the case. In the course of an investigation led by Special Agent McGrath, it was discovered that a male person of interest had a brother and a father who was still alive. To advance the investigation, a plan was devised to obtain a DNA sample from the brother. FBI agent Mark Dring lent his expertise to the plan, which ultimately resulted in a DNA sample collected from the brother and submitted to the crime lab. The analysis of the DNA sample from the brother excluded him as a potential suspect in the case. Later, in December 2022, the focus of the investigation shifted towards the father. With the help of Lt. Paul Hayes of the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency State Bureau of Investigation, Special Agent McGrath was able to determine that the father was currently living in Birmingham, Alabama. A plan was being developed to collect DNA from the father when they discovered that he had recently traveled to Zion, Illinois, and was residing there. To proceed with the collection of the father's DNA, a search warrant was drafted and issued. The search warrant granted the authorities the legal right to collect a DNA sample from the father which would be analyzed to determine if he could be connected to the crime being investigated. With the cooperation of law enforcement officers and relevant agencies, the search warrant was executed and the DNA sample was collected from the father for further analysis. In February of 2023, a DNA sample was collected from the father and subsequently sent to the laboratory for analysis. In early March of the same year, investigator Blackmore was informed by Pulikovsky that the buckle swab from the father was a match to the DNA obtained from Linda Fields. According to Polakowski, the likelihood of a random person's DNA matching that of the DNA profile taken from Linda Fields' body was one in one quadrillion. This statistic highlighted the significance of the DNA match and strengthened the case against the father who was identified as Lucas Alonzo. According to Blackmore, within the past year, Alonzo had moved from Alabama to Illinois and had landed a job in Wisconsin. Blackmore expressed that the timing of Alonzo's job starting in Racine and the results from the lab confirming a match couldn't have been any better. However, in February, Alonzo was stopped at a traffic check. And as Blackmore explained, Alonzo's DNA was actually collected during the traffic stop the day before the anniversary of the homicide. On February 23, 2023, Lucas Alonzo, a resident of Zion, Illinois, was detained by authorities at his workplace in Racine. This came after he was brought in for questioning regarding the death of Linda Fields, with whom he had reportedly been seen leaving a local bar all those many years ago. During his interrogation, Alonzo admitted to having had sexual intercourse with Fields after they were dropped off near the lakefront. However, he also claimed that he had strangled her in a fit of anger after a heated argument. Alonzo maintained that he thought Fields was still alive when he left the scene of the incident as she was apparently still shouting at him at the time. Nonetheless, authorities took him into custody on suspicion of murder and he was subsequently arrested at his workplace. The investigation into Fields' death is ongoing and authorities are still trying to piece together what exactly happened on the night in question. However, with Alonzo's admission of guilt, it appears that they may be closer to finding the answers they seek. On March 8, 2023, Alonzo appeared in court for the first time, and it was noted that a cash bond had been set for him at a whopping sum of $1 million. This amount of money would need to be paid up front in order for Alonzo to be released while he awaits further legal proceedings.
The establishment of such a high bond amount suggests that the nature of Alonzo's alleged offense is quite serious and the court wants to ensure that he remains in custody until the matter is fully resolved. According to Carl Fields, son of Linda Fields, the recent news about the arrest of the suspect in his mother's decades-old murder case has brought a sense of closure to their family. He expressed his gratitude and acknowledged that they are now closer to achieving justice. Carl mentioned that he had always held on to the hope that the truth about his mother's murder would be uncovered someday, and it seems that day has finally arrived. He added that they had to live with the burden of the unsolved case for a long time, but now they can finally find solace. In conclusion, Carl is thankful that this day has come, and he expressed his gratitude for it. The breakthrough in the case was the result of the tireless effort of multiple law enforcement agencies over the years. The Racine Police Department, led by Chief Maurice Robinson, expressed their hope that this successful resolution would restore hope to other families still waiting for justice for their loved ones. They extended their heartfelt thanks to the Department of Criminal Investigations, particularly Agent McGrath and Agent Juanez, the FBI, and the State Crime Lab for their valuable support in cracking this case. Special recognition was also given to Lieutenant Paul Hayes for his assistance in Alabama to Chief Art Howell and other members of the Racine Police Department for their unwavering dedication to finding justice for Linda Fields. The arrest of the suspect in Linda Fields' murder is a reminder that justice is always possible no matter how much time has passed. The tireless efforts of law enforcement agencies in pursuing justice for victims and their families are commendable and their commitment to this cause should inspire us all. The closure that this development has brought to Linda Fields' family is a testament to the importance of perseverance, hope, and the unwavering pursuit of truth and justice. After 23 years of uncertainty and pain, justice has finally been served. For the family and loved ones of the victim, this moment is bittersweet. But what did you think of the case? What do you think Lucas Alonzo's sentence should be? In Kosciuszko County, Indiana, Webster Lake covers 640 acres and has a maximum depth of 65 feet. Little over 1,000 people live in North Webster, a community that borders the lake on the west. The lake is a well-liked location for sailing, boating, swimming, jet skiing, and simply unwinding on the beach during the summer. But it was here in this serene lakeside community that a horrific crime took place in 1975. In the small lake community of North Webster, a horrific crime took place on August 6, 1975, that has remained unmatched in severity to this day. The murder of a local teenager named Laurel Jean Mitchell left the community in shock. Despite the passage of time, the memory of this tragedy continued to linger in the minds of the people in North Webster. According to police records containing multiple interviews, it can be inferred that Laurel departed from her job at a restaurant in Epworth Forest at around 10 p.m. on August 6, 1975. She began walking along Epworth Forest Drive towards Adventureland, an amusement park that was once prosperous. She unfortunately didn't return home, which to Laurel's parents was highly suspicious as Laurel was always back home on time. And even if not, she would never forget to inform her parents. With rising concern, Mitchell's parents alerted the police of her disappearance. Laurel's lifeless body was discovered in the Elkhart River in Noble County by fishermen after several hours had passed since her disappearance. It was apparent that the perpetrator intended for her body to be found in that location. Nonetheless, the identity of the person responsible for her murder remained a mystery. According to the release, officials at first thought Mitchell's death was the result of accidental drowning. An autopsy found Mitchell showed signs that she had fought for her life. The victim, Laurel Jean Mitchell, was the daughter of Richard D. Dick Mitchell, a well-known public figure in the community. Sadly, he passed away in 2012, never having received closure on what happened to his daughter. Laurel's mother, Wilma Mitchell, was involved in community service through the North Webster Food Pantry, but she too passed away last year without ever discovering the truth behind her daughter's brutal murder. The Mitchell family was left to grapple with the unimaginable pain of not knowing who was responsible for such a heinous act. As days turned into weeks and weeks into months, the investigators devoted countless hours to piecing together the puzzle that was this case. However, despite their best efforts, they were unable to identify the perpetrator or find any leads that could help solve the case. The investigation continued for years with detectives working tirelessly to uncover the truth. The case was passed down from one investigator to another, and each one made a valiant effort to bring justice to the victim and her family. However, despite all their efforts, the case remained unsolved for five long decades. 
The family of the victim was left without any closure or answers, enduring immeasurable pain and suffering as they grappled with the loss of their loved one. They were haunted by the fact that her killer remained at large, roaming free while their family member lay in a cold grave, robbed of her future. The Indiana State Police conducted a thorough investigation of Miss Mitchell's murder, which involved preserving all of her clothing and personal items for DNA testing purposes. These items included her shoes, sweatshirt, bra, underwear, and denim jeans. According to the affidavit, the investigation revealed that on the night of her disappearance, Miss Mitchell had planned to meet up with friends at Adventureland, a recreational facility located about half a mile away from the church camp in North Webster. At the beginning of the investigation, it was reported that a North Webster resident had informed the police that he heard what he believed to be the sound of someone slamming the trunk of a car, possibly an Oldsmobile. Additionally, investigators were informed by another resident that she had heard several voices say, let's get or let's get her. The investigation into the murder of Miss Mitchell was characterized by intermittent progress over a period spanning from 2013 to 2019. Multiple witnesses came forward and provided information to the police regarding two men named Mr. Lehman and Mr. Bandy. According to these witnesses, these two men had allegedly confessed to being responsible for Miss Mitchell's death in the immediate aftermath of the murder. One of the witnesses who had gone on a date with Mr. Lehman recounted a conversation in which he had discussed his participation in a crime with Mr. Bandy. The details of this conversation were said to align with the anatomical findings that were reported in the autopsy of Miss Mitchell. These findings suggest that the two men had provided specific details that matched the physical evidence collected during the investigation. Despite this promising information, progress in the investigation remained inconsistent over the years. Captain Kevin Smith, a state police officer, had been working on the cold case of Miss Mitchell's murder for 20 years. According to him, the investigation faced similar challenges to other cold cases, with the passage of time making it increasingly difficult to gather reliable evidence. Witnesses who could have potentially provided crucial information have passed away, and the memories of those who remain have faded over time. All these have made it very challenging for the investigators, especially given the length of time that has elapsed since the crime was committed. Despite these difficulties, Captain Smith and his team had persisted in their efforts to bring justice to Miss Mitchell and her family. In 2019, Captain Smith sent some of Miss Mitchell's clothing to the state laboratory for DNA testing and the results revealed a male DNA profile on the clothing. This finding led to the investigation of three additional potential suspects, but all of them were excluded as possible contributors to the DNA found on the clothing. According to police records, a suspect named Mr. Bandy drove a 1971 Oldsmobile at the time of Miss Mitchell's murder. Mr. Bandy has a previous criminal record. He had pleaded guilty to solicitation and contributing to the delinquency of a minor in 2001 and pleaded guilty to two counts of molestation in 2016, serving nearly six years. In 2023, the Indiana State Police collected a DNA sample from Mr. Bandy and sent it to the state laboratory for testing. On January 13, 2023, the lab confirmed that Mr. Bandy's DNA was a more likely match to the DNA found on Miss Mitchell's clothing than any other person. However, there is no mention in the affidavit about any DNA match to Mr. Lehman. While the Indiana State Police did not provide details about the techniques used to solve Miss Mitchell's murder, Ashley Hall, the director of the Forensic Science Graduate Program at the University of California, Davis, commented that the method appeared to be a standard genetic identification technology used in crime labs known as STR or short tandem repeat. STR analysis is a DNA profiling technique that compares the number of repeats of specific sequences of DNA in a sample. It is a common method used in forensic investigations to identify suspects by analyzing biological evidence such as blood or saliva found at a crime scene. The technique can also be used to establish relationships between individuals or to identify human remains. STR analysis can be performed using various instruments, including capillary electrophoresis and polymerase chain reaction. The resulting DNA profile can be compared to profiles in a DNA database or used to exclude suspects from the investigation. Overall, STR analysis is a powerful tool for forensic investigations and its application has contributed to solving numerous criminal cases. According to Dr. Hall, the technology is being developed to become increasingly sensitive and is capable of detecting smaller amounts of DNA than before. 
He also mentioned that they are now able to pick up much more DNA than they previously could. Dr. Hall stated that Miss Mitchell's case serves as a good example of the power and evolution of DNA testing to aid in criminal investigations. Coming back to 2023, the two individuals were connected to the victim by DNA evidence according to the investigators after nearly 50 years and technological improvements. The Indiana State Police Laboratory Division was essential in the case, according to Captain Kevin Smith of the State Police, who said during a news conference on February 7, 2023, that science finally delivered us the proof we needed. According to a press release, Bandy and Lehman were arrested without any resistance from their respective homes on the morning of February 6, 2023. They have each been charged with one count of murder and are currently being held in the Noble County Jail without the possibility of bond. During a recent press conference, Sheriff Smith expressed his gratitude towards the media for their coverage, which helped gather valuable information from the citizens. Both men were informed by Circuit Court Judge Michael Kramer that they were being charged with murder in the first degree, which was the legal definition of murder at the time of the alleged crime. The guideline penalty for a murder conviction in Indiana is 55 years in prison, with a range of sentences of 45 to 65 years. Yet because the offenses were committed in 1975, both individuals might receive the maximum punishment at the time, which was a life sentence. Captain Smith contacted Ms. Nicely and her brother, Bruce Mitchell, to inform them of the arrest of two men in connection with their sister's murder. Although taken aback by the news, Ms. Kinsley's predominant emotion was a sense of regret that her parents who had passed away were not alive to witness this development. She expressed that despite the passage of 47 long years, the news made it feel like the event had happened only yesterday. The shock of the event was still fresh in her mind. The news of the arrest brought a renewed sense of pain and trauma to the surface. In an account given to the New York Times, Miss Nisley, the younger sister of Miss Mitchell, recounted that at the age of 12, she had to endure the horrific experience of losing her sister. Prior to this tragedy, their childhood in North Webster was unremarkable with a typical upbringing that many would relate to. According to her, it was a very small town where they felt safe and could come and go as they pleased during summers and never thought they'd experience something so traumatic like this. Miss Neasley, who is now 60 years old, expressed her profound disappointment upon learning that someone as kind-hearted as Miss Mitchell was the victim of such a heinous crime. She believes that Miss Mitchell had the potential to make a significant positive impact on the world had she been allowed to live. Nevertheless, she is grateful that the perpetrator was finally apprehended and is grateful to those who came forward with information. Nicely expressed that they would always wonder how she would have turned out and how she missed prom, graduation, getting married, and having kids. Nicely also mentioned that they didn't have anyone to share all of those experiences with and help them grow up. Despite the arrest of the suspects, the investigation into the murder is far from over. As stated by Noble County Prosecutor Jim Morey, this arrest is just the beginning of the legal process and there is still much work to be done. The prosecution of these defendants is just starting and the investigation into the crime will continue until justice is served. It is crucial to note that the arrest of Bandy and Lehman is a significant step towards finding the truth behind this heinous crime, but the judicial system will continue to work tirelessly to bring closure to the victim's family and friends. August 17, 1983 was an ordinary evening in Toronto, Ontario, and a family was setting up the dinner table awaiting Susan Tice, a 45-year-old mother of four. It was unlike Susan not to show up without sending any word. As hours passed and Susan didn't arrive, her family grew worried and sent her brother-in-law to check on her. When he arrived at Susan's house, he was shocked to his core when he discovered Susan's body in her bedroom lying in a pool of blood. Around four months after Susan's death on a chilly night in December, Erin Gilmore's body was found in her apartment by her boyfriend, Anthony Monk. On December 20th, 1983, Anthony was supposed to pick up his 22-year-old girlfriend for their date at around 9 p.m. after her shift at the clothing store she worked at. Anthony arrived a little late around 9.20 p.m. He walked up to Erin's apartment and discovered her lifeless body wrapped up in a blanket. What really happened to Erin and Susan? Did Aaron and Susan know each other? The police and the victims' families have had the same questions for the last 39 years. Welcome to Cold Case File, where we bring you the stories of notorious cold cases from history. Today, we will be looking at the cases of Susan Tyson, who finally got justice 39 years after their brutal murders with the help of genetic genealogy. 
But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now without any further ado, let's dive into the mystery. Toronto is the capital of the province of Ontario located in southeastern Canada. Apart from being the most populous city in Canada, it is also a multicultural city and is the country's commercial, financial, and trading center. Transcribed with audiototext.app by Gems on December 25, 2023, page 1 of 13, Toronto is known for its skilled theater, music, and art community, which makes the city a great attraction to all. But this beautiful place is also the home to nearly 700 unsolved murder cases which went cold. And sadly, today, we will look at two of these horrific crimes that took place back in 1983. It is here in Toronto where our case begins. Susan O'Hara Willis-Croft Tice, born November 13, 1937, was the daughter of Dr. Burton Willis-Croft and the former Jane Wallace of Leith. She got married to Fred Tice back in 1961. Susan was 45 and a mother of four at the time of her passing in 1983. She was often described by her friends and family as a warm and cheerful person with a beautiful heart who cared deeply for her four children, Ben, John, Christian, and Jason. They looked up to her and thought of her as the glue that held everyone together. All her children's friends used to call her Ma or Mrs. T. In July 1983, Susan had divorced her husband, the father of her four children, in Calgary where she worked as a nurse. Soon after that, she decided to move to her hometown and made her way to Toronto. Susan started working here as a family therapist with the families of people with disadvantaged children. Susan and her daughter Christina were very close and shared a special bond, but little did they know that a tragedy was around the corner. It was a peaceful evening on August 17, 1983, and Susan's family was busy setting up the dinner table for a family gathering. Hours passed, but Susan didn't show up, which worried her family. They grew worried as Susan wasn't like this. She had never not shown up without informing them. They decided to wait for her, but when hours passed and there were still no signs of Susan, her family was convinced that something wasn't right. Susan's brother-in-law hopped in his car and drove to Susan's house on 341 Grace Street to make sure that everything was okay with her. As he reached there, the whole setting looked a bit unusual. There was unopened mail piled up and all the lights were off, which made it seem like nobody was home. He assumed Susan must not have been home but still knocked on the door. When nobody answered, he tried to look inside through windows, but it was too dark. He figured that something wasn't right and decided to enter through the back door. He found the door wide open. When he entered Susan's residence, she was nowhere to be found. Her brother-in-law kept looking for her and suddenly the phone rang. He answered and it was Christian, Susan's daughter who was calling from her summer camp. Christian asked her uncle where her mother was, to which he didn't respond as he had finally found Susan in the upstairs bedroom. There she was, lying unresponsive in a pool of her own blood. Susan's brother-in-law immediately called up the authorities. The police arrived at Susan's residence and immediately got to work. After doing a thorough search in and around the residence, the police found no signs of forced entry. Susan had been sexually assaulted and stabbed multiple times in the chest. The murder weapon was nowhere to be found. The only witness was Susan's neighbor who had a little bit of information for them. She said that she heard the screams of a woman four times around 1.30 a.m. and also heard someone walk by Susan's house. She didn't, however, think it was anything to call the police about. The only evidence that the police found was DNA obtained from the semen left at the crime scene. This was not enough for the police department to lead them to Susan's killer. The police had no leads or suspects. As there were no suspects in Susan's case, police started questioning everyone in Susan's family and work community to find out whether they knew something about the case. The investigator thought of Susan's ex-husband, Fred Tice, as a possible suspect, but upon finding out his whereabouts at the time the crime was committed, he was soon cleared. The police department was going around in circles. There were no new leads, no suspects or witnesses, and they always seemed to hit a dead end. With hopes of someone coming to them with some kind of information, the police department kept the case open. The detectives were looking for tiny clues or any bits of information which could lead them to Susan's killer. They waited and waited, but nothing came up. The media too covered the case hoping that someone would show up with some kind of information but were let down. Susan's case left everyone shocked not only her family but also the family she worked with. The thought of someone getting away with murder was extremely distressing for Susan's family and the police department. Months passed, but Susan's case looked as if it had reached a dead end. Her case file joined the pile of many other unsolved cold cases, which would soon be forgotten. 
Sadly, Susan's family was left confused without any answers. Susan Tyson was buried at Leith United Church Cemetery, Gray County, Ontario, Canada. Aaron Harrison Gilmore was born February 3, 1961, and was the daughter of David Gilmore and Anna Gilmore. It was 1983 and Aaron was a 22-year-old blonde with a magnetic personality and a bright future. Her brothers, Sean and Caitlin McCowan, described her as an amazing friend to everyone around her and a natural beauty who was always full of life. She was a career-driven person who still never compromised about spending time with her family. Erin was a happy and intelligent girl. She dreamed of becoming a fashion designer one day and was working at a clothing store called Robin's Knits in 1983. The store was located right below her apartment at 27B on Hazelton Avenue. She worked there to gain experience in the industry and build on her experience as a designer and as a model. At the time, she was dating Anthony Monk, who was the son of Peter Monk, her father David Gilmore's business partner. Aaron Gilmore was the only child of David Gilmore, a business tycoon who made his fortune through starting one of the largest coal mining companies in the world. Aaron and her father were extremely close and spent a great deal of time together. They had no idea that tragedy was waiting for them just around the corner. Just four months after Susan's murder, five days before Christmas on December 20, 1983, Aaron Gilmore was also found dead. On the night of December 19, 1983, Aaron had called her two half-brothers Sean and Caitlin McCowan over for a sleepover at her apartment on Hazelton Avenue. This was like a ritual for all three of them and both of the brothers enjoyed Aaron's company. Christmas was around the corner and everyone was excited about the festive season. They spent the night watching movies and eating popcorn before going to bed. The next morning, Aaron dropped Caitlin home and Sean at the market as he had some shopping to do for Christmas. Little did he know that this was the last time he'd see his sister alive and well. After returning home, Aaron began her shift at Robin's Knits and continued her day as any other. At the end of her shift around 9 p.m., she was supposed to close the store, meaning she'd be the last person there. Aaron's boyfriend, Anthony Monk, had promised to pick her up from the store for their date at 9 p.m. But as he stopped to withdraw some cash from an ATM, he was about 20 minutes late. He was expecting Aaron to be waiting for him outside the store, but when he reached there, he didn't see her. Anthony assumed that she had gone upstairs to get ready for their date. Anthony took the stairs leading to Aaron's apartment. He found the main door open, which seemed odd to him. It was unlike Aaron to be so careless, but he thought that maybe she had left the door open for him. As Anthony walked in and looked around, he couldn't find Aaron. He called out her name multiple times, but Aaron didn't respond. Anthony opened the door to the bedroom. She wasn't there either, but there was a blanket rolled up right in the middle of the bed. Anthony walked towards it and pulled on the edges of the blanket, fearing the worst, and his worst fears were confirmed. There was Aaron wrapped up in a blanket, not responding. Anthony didn't understand what had happened until he saw the blood spreading out on the bed from under the blanket. Anthony was terrified and without wasting a second called up the police. When the police reached Aaron's apartment, they noted that she had been left wrapped up in a blanket after being killed. Aaron too was a victim of sexual assault and murder. Here too, police found DNA evidence in the form of semen at the crime scene. When the police examined the crime scene, they didn't find any signs of a break-in or forced entry. Aaron had been strangled and stabbed multiple times in the chest. There were no suspects or witnesses and the murder weapon wasn't found anywhere. What shocked the police department the most was the fact that everything that happened with Aaron that night happened within a span of only 20 minutes. Between Aaron closing the store at 9 p.m. and Anthony arriving at 9.20 p.m., the culprit was able to assault and murder Aaron and escape without a trace. With the amount of evidence and information the police had, finding Aaron's killer was going to be a tough job for them. What made Aaron's case different from Susan's was the amount of publicity and media attention it garnered. Aaron Gilmore was the child of the business tycoon David Gilmore, who was a well-known figure in Toronto back then. The police questioned Aaron's family and colleagues initially and found nothing odd. Anthony, Aaron's boyfriend, was thought to be a suspect in Aaron's case as the police thought that Aaron might have known her killer, they had covered her body in a blanket, something killers do to help subdue their guilt. But eventually, Anthony was cleared and eliminated as a suspect. The investigation seemed to be leading nowhere. The police were now desperate to catch this horrific killer. The publicity on Aaron's case brought in a lot of new leads and suspects. The investigators questioned over 700 people in connection to Aaron's case, but all were eliminated one by one. 
Due to the lack of evidence or any proof, the police were unable to find a potential suspect. Going around in circles, Aaron's case also went cold. Initially, the police didn't connect Susan in Aaron's cases to each other, but found the similarities eerie. It wasn't until 2000 that the police discovered a link between these two cases. Using the advanced DNA developing technology, the police were able to conclude that Susan and Aaron were assaulted and killed by the same person. Using the DNA samples collected from both crime scenes, the investigators noted that the DNA samples obtained from both crime scenes were a perfect match. The two DNA samples were an identical match to each other, but there were no other matches in the Canadian DNA database. This gave rise to a lot of new questions. The police department was now curious to find out whether this man was responsible for any more crimes back in the 1980s. If he had struck before, if he had struck ever since 1983, and if he was still on the loose. In November 2008, the Toronto Police Department announced a $50,000 reward for anyone who had any information that could help the police find the murderer of Aaron and Susan. But sadly, it had been so many years since the crime actually took place that not many remembered or knew about it. The publicity surrounding these cases had significantly declined over the last few decades. The police department eagerly hoped for an informant to show up, but when that never happened, Aaron's family chipped in and the reward was increased to $200,000 in 2012, but even that reward went unclaimed. Even though the world had lost any hope of ever finding Aaron and Susan's killer, there was a group of detectives who were determined to bring them justice. Police even received a tip that indicated that both Aaron and Susan frequently visited bars and restaurants in the Yorkville area where they might have met their killer. Police determined that since both were murdered in their own homes and there were no signs of a break-in, the killer figured out where they both lived and started to follow them or knew the women personally. But this was merely one of the many possibilities of how the crimes took place. Aaron Gilmore's brother, Sean McCowan, and Caitlin McCowan kept constant touch with Detective Sergeant Steve Smith. Ever since the police were able to link the murders of Aaron and Susan in 2000, the case started to make slow progress but still remained in the pile of cold cases. In the month of March in 2016, the investigators released a YouTube video urging people to come forward with any information they had. This yet again led nowhere. Later in 2020, Sean and Caitlin McGowan reached out to Detective Smith and asked if genetic genealogy could be used to track down their sister's killer. Little did they know that the police department was already working on this. In 2019, the investigators had made use of forensic genetic genealogy with aid from Othram, an American corporation that specializes in using forensic genealogy to resolve unsolved murders, disappearances, and identification of unidentified murder victims. Othram then prepared a broad DNA profile using forensic-grade genome sequencing with only the tiny strands of DNA that had been collected at the crime scenes. Toronto police were now rustling through the DNA profiles, which had already been uploaded on various Canadian DNA databases, hoping to find a match which could lead them to at least a distant relative of the killer. And in 2022, using the broad DNA profile developed by Othram, the detectives were able to trace the DNA back to two sets of grandparents. Hence, they figured out that whoever killed Aaron and Susan was related to one of these four people. Without wasting any time, the detectives got to work and started scanning the family tree thoroughly until they got to one family branch seemed highly likely to be that of the killer. This family branch led the investigators to a generation of five brothers. The Toronto Police Department was finally able to make a list of possible suspects and had narrowed it down to these five brothers. They were quite sure that one of these five brothers had killed Aaron and Susan, but without getting a DNA sample from all of the brothers, it would not be possible to determine which one the killer might be. It wasn't going to be easy for the police department to collect the DNA of these five brothers as they couldn't directly collect it without a court order. And with the little amount of evidence they had, the court wouldn't issue them a warrant. The Toronto Police Department resorted to collecting the DNA samples of the five brothers inconspicuously through beer cans and glass and other sources. They were able to successfully collect DNA samples of four brothers but couldn't get their hands on the fifth sample. The fifth brother was Joseph George Sutherland. The investigators ran a test on all the DNA samples they had collected and were able to eliminate all the four brothers as the killer one by one. The investigators were now sure that Joseph was the killer, but they still needed his DNA sample to prove it. The Toronto Police Department then came up with a plan. 
Using the samples they had collected of the four other brothers, the detectives asked for a warrant based on the fact that all the other brothers were eliminated as suspects and that the fifth brother was most likely the killer of Susan and Aaron. Looking at the research, the investigation, and the progress made by the detectives in the case, the judge agreed and issued a warrant to the detectives which allowed them to demand a DNA sample from Joseph Sutherland. They all rushed to Joseph's current residence in Muscany in Ontario and collected his DNA sample. When the results came back, the detectives heaved a sigh of relief. They had finally got their man. Joseph's DNA sample came back as an exact match to the one found at Susan and Aaron's crime scenes. Susan and Aaron's killer finally had a name and a face after nearly 40 years of pain and suffering. Joseph George Sutherland was born in December 1961 in Fort Albany, Ontario. He had recently been residing in Muscany, Ontario. Joseph attended Northern Lights Secondary School in Muscany and Humber College in Etobicoke, Ontario. All this time, he had been living a simple life in Muscany, roughly 850 kilometers north of Toronto. He was quite active on his social media accounts. He was accused of allegedly killing and sexually assaulting Susan Tyson and Aaron Gilmore. If he was indeed the murderer at the time of committing the murders of Aaron and Susan, Joseph was only 21 years old. On November 24, 2022, the police arrived at Joseph Sutherland's Musini residence and arrested him. At age 61, on November 25, 2022, Joseph was charged with two counts of first-degree murder of Aaron Gilmore and Susan Tyson. He is currently being held in the Toronto South Detention Center as he awaits his trial. It has also been noted that Joseph does not have any previous criminal records, which explains why his DNA data wasn't available in the Canadian DNA database. Sean and Caitlin McCowan were extremely relieved when they heard about Joseph's arrest. Sean received a call from Detective Smith informing him about the arrest and he was beyond happy. He recalled that there were a lot of happy tears and a lot of swearing, but there was finally relief. Sean remembered that the day when his mother told him about his sister's murder, he punched a hole in the wall out of rage. He only wished that his mother, who passed away two years ago, was here right now to see this day. Susan's only daughter, Christian, is now a mother herself. When she heard the news of her mother's killer finally being found and arrested, she felt at peace. She only wished that Susan was here today to meet her grandchildren. Christian remembered how traumatized she was back in 1983 when she lost her mother. She would often go to her mother's house and walk up and down the stairs, trying to figure out what exactly had happened. Even today, out of fear, Christian sleeps with a baseball bat in the corner of her room as she is concerned for her safety. But all that had finally come to an end. Christian gave her mother's picture a fist pump and said, we got him, upon hearing the news. And Smith, now 85, was Susan's best friend back in the day. They met as teenagers in Camp Wapameo at Algonquin Provincial Park and had met Susan the weekend before she was killed and had plans to meet her again the next weekend as well, and expressed her grief, saying how sad it is that she got to have a wonderful life in all these years, but her best friend Susan was robbed of the same opportunity, and she felt relieved when Joseph's arrest was made. When asked about Joseph's reaction upon being arrested, Detective Smith stated that it seemed like he saw it coming. He knew that after committing such crimes, he couldn't hide forever, and that someday he'd be caught, and that day had come. Detective Smith also stated that in his 25 years of working with Toronto Police, this was the most complex case that they had worked. The Toronto Police Department has stated that they're running a check on all the other cold murder cases in Ontario to see if Joseph is connected to any of them as Joseph had been living in Ontario for the last 39 years. Susan Tyson and Aaron Gilmore were two beautiful and hardworking souls whose lives were cut short abruptly. But now they can both rest easy. After a long journey through struggle and pain, the police were able to put their killer behind bars. Technology advancement in genetic genealogy helped the detectives and played a major role in solving this case. With the help of a tiny strand of DNA, the detectives were able to narrow down a potential suspect family and then work their way down to a single suspect. Genetics genealogy is a technology that is constantly improving and making great progress. In the future, it will surely play an important role in the cracking of many cold cases like this. Do you think Joseph could have been connected to more unsolved murders in Ontario? What do you think could have driven Joseph to commit such crimes at such a young age? Let us know your thoughts.